Okay, well, hello everyone. So here we are, <coughs> ready to launch officially the Waltham Institute. Um, it's exciting, October 24th, 2022. We are, it's uh, day zero for the Waltham Institute. Um, I'll talk a bit about the backstory. James Boyd, who will be leading, directing the Institute, will talk about the forward story after that. And then we're going to have a discussion uh, with some of our senior associates um, about uh, all sorts of things, probably. So I will say it's it's always nice to see when things happen fairly quickly. Six months ago, we realized we really have to launch the Wolfram Institute. We have, as I described in April, a, a science opportunity overload. We have too many things to do in science and uh, too few resources to do them and we really need a, a channel for getting these things to happen. And six months later, here we are with the Wolfram Institute officially launched. So it's um, it's kind of a, a, a very exciting moment, I think, in what's possible in science and in things around science. Um, there's kind of a, there's a lot of low hanging fruit and uh, I'm looking forward to the Wolfram Institute and me personally being involved in through it, picking some of that that low hanging fruit. You know, I think the thing to understand is that if you look at the history of science and other kinds of intellectual development, there tend to be these, these moments when some new methodology or new paradigm is invented. And then there's a period of five, 10, maybe more years when there's kind of rapid progress because there's a lot of low hanging fruit to be picked. And then it's a kind of hundred year slog to get to the next one of those moments where there's rapid progress. And the exciting thing is that uh, I didn't expect this. I didn't expect to see it in my lifetime, actually, that um, through the kind of tower, particularly through the kind of tower of science and technology that we've been involved in building for the last 40 years or so, we got to a point where there's rapid progress to be made. And uh, it's it, what we saw with the Wolfram Physics Project that was um, launched um, in uh, in the spring of 2020 was uh, kind of as I see that as being the hundred year moment for physics. About a hundred years ago, there was lots of progress made in physics from general relativity and then to quantum mechanics and so on. And there's been a long slog ever since working through the consequences of those ideas. Now we have kind of a new paradigm that lets us get the next sort of uh, uh, bunch of rapid progress. And, and the same has, it's become clear is true with metamathematics and the foundations of mathematics. And uh, what we're seeing is that the paradigm that sort of originally emerged from the physics project and from this whole tower of science and technology that we've been involved in building for a long time, that paradigm just has a, a tremendous amount of opportunity in lots of different fields of science, technology, philosophy, other areas. So I just, you know, I have to give this sort of a little bit of the historical backstory here. Um, you know, uh, I think one could kind of identify sort of four paradigmatic epochs, I think, in uh, four sort of paradigms in, in science. The first one, pretty old, it's kind of the origins of science in antiquity. The first paradigm is sort of answer, asking the question, what are things made of? Things are made of definite repeated things. Maybe they're atoms, maybe they're vortices, maybe they're something else. But this first paradigm is the story of what are things made of? What is the sort of systematic story of what things are made of? And, and that first paradigm, which is something that sort of got launched in antiquity, there are still many areas of science that are really dominated by that first paradigm of, of sort of what are things, what is some, what are things made of? Well, then it took a very long time before the next paradigm emerged, and that paradigm emerged in the late 1600s. And that paradigm was the kind of paradigm of mathematical formulas, applying mathematics and the ideas of mathematical formulas to describe the world and to inject ideas into science. And that kind of, uh, that was the launching point for kind of the mathematical approaches to science, which dominated for first physics and then uh, lots of other areas. And that takes us, that sort of second paradigm is almost the defining feature of exact science for, for about 300 years. Finally, uh, by the 1980s, we started to have a, a new paradigm, the computational paradigm, something I was much involved in, in getting launched. 
the idea that instead of describing the world in terms of mathematical formulas, one can describe it in terms of programs, and one can look at the sort of the progress of, of, of time as being a progression of computation. And that led to ideas like computational irreducibility. It led to a huge collection of modeling methodologies made possible by the idea of, of having uh, models based on programs rather than based on equations. And it's been sort of a, a silent transition that's happened from a time when if you were doing serious exact science, you were using mathematical equations to a time when it's routine and really the dominant form of, of new modeling tends to be based on, on computation and on programs. So that was kind of the, the third paradigm. And, and there's, a, there's a huge amount still to develop with that third paradigm, as there is even with the first and second paradigms. But there's a huge amount to develop with the third paradigm. Uh, areas like ruleology, the study of simple rules and what they do, the kind of meta-modeling to go from uh, kinds of descriptions that we have of things in the world down to the kinds of things about which we can do sort of very basic science. But the thing that was a big surprise to me was the emergence of this fourth paradigm, which is something that had uh, been kind of bubbling around for a few decades. I, I had certainly been uh, thinking about it a bit in the 1990s and so on. But with our physics project, we were kind of forced into this fourth paradigm. And the fourth paradigm is what I might call the multi-computational paradigm, a paradigm in which one thinks not just about computational processes where one is going sort of from the from the input and then compute, compute, compute in a sort of single thread to the answer, but something where there are many threads of time, all branching and merging. There are many different histories that occur all interacting with each other, where, where in addition to the idea of, of uh, uh, having sort of progression through time, there is also the idea of kind of equivalencing different paths in time. And one feature of the fourth paradigm is that it, it inevitably involves the observer. It's, it's all about the sort of story of the interaction between how the observer manages to conflate together different kinds of things that happen in the world and how the sort of inexorable progress of computation moves things forward. And this fourth paradigm is first something we're sort of forced into by thinking about physics and particularly quantum mechanics and so on. But then we realize it's also a core paradigm for thinking about metamathematics. And then we realize Actually, this is a general paradigm that can be applied to a lot of different fields, whether it's biology, thinking about molecular biology, thinking about biological evolution, whether it's economics, whether it's distributed computing. A lot of different areas seem to fundamentally rely on this kind of fourth paradigm. And, and sort of a core feature of it is this interplay between the computational irreducibility, these irreducible computational processes, and even multi-computational irreducibility, and the role of the observer the way in which we take all the sort of complexity of the world and try and turn it into something that we can sort of put into our minds and so on. So anyway, th this, this sort of fourth paradigm is, is the, the big thing that's just opened up and where we're just starting to get kind of a, a way of talking about it, a way of thinking about it, starting to see its first applications. I think it's going to be an incredibly fertile uh, kind of direction in, in science, sort of a, a, a new intellectual area you know, each of these paradigms has had certain kinds of uh, ways of thinking about things that have been introduced. You know, in the second paradigm, we got concepts like force and energy and, and momentum and so on. In the third paradigm, we got concepts like computational irreducibility, principle of computational equivalence, things like this. The fourth paradigm, we're starting to see things about observers and the interplay of observers with other kinds of things. These are, these are very core ideas that uh, reach right to the foundations of lots of areas of science and give us the raw material to build a lot of exciting things. Well, it's um, uh, to me, it's sort of interesting to see the kind of the time scales over which these paradigms emerge. And a lot of what, uh, you know, these are sort of 100 year type timescales and so on. But the thing that's really exciting is right now we're in this one of these moments of rapid growth. And we get to see, I hope, some very exciting things happen in just the next few years. And the question really is uh, how to make that best happen. And one of the things that uh, uh, I've been involved in for a long time is both sort of doing the content of science and technology, understanding the interplay between the tools that we build from technology and the ideas that we get from science, but also trying to create a good intellectual and, and organizational structure to kind of move these things forward as quickly as possible. I have to say 36 years ago, 
I started a, uh, a research center uh, to, uh, to in kind of the early years of the third paradigm. And uh, uh, the, the things I did were things that were based on kind of what I understood about how to make things organizationally work back then. 36 years later, I'd been running a company for, for most of those 36 years. And at our company, we've really spent a lot of effort trying to figure out how best to really move forward innovative things. Those methods are things that have allowed us to deliver technology products, but they've also been things that I've used to be able to deliver science, whether it's new kind of science, whether it's our physics project and so on. And part of what we are planning to do at the Institute is to leverage what we've learned about kind of how to move forward projects in a strategic and innovative way, leverage that to, to really deliver as much as we can uh, from the resources that we have and the resources that we'll get uh, with the Institute. And I, I would say that, that, that um, uh, ours, the approaches we have, it's not the only way to make sort of progress in science and in intellectual areas, uh, you know, academia, provides a sort of alternative approach. I would say that the, the approach we have is, is, a, is a kind of a, a, a very strategy-driven approach. Uh, I will say that we're very fortunate that uh, the physics project uh, has spawned a, a lot of interest in the academic world and a lot of activities. And in fact, it's, it's exciting to me that just a couple of weeks ago, um, the Jonathan Gorard, who is a key person in the physics project, launched uh, a research center at the University of Cardiff in the UK, um, embedded in academia, launched a research center aimed in some of the same kinds of uh, these theoretical directions that we are with, with the Wolfram Institute. And there will be more such, such efforts. I know there are several afoot, and we expect this kind of constellation of organizations trying to move forward this very productive time in, in the history of, of, of science. Uh, our particular approach is based, as I say, on kind of what we've learned from our company and uh, and so on. And it's kind of uh, uh, something where, well, the, the, uh, the, the, the real thing that I suppose is exciting about some of what's going on is that um, uh, it, um, uh, back in the, uh, in the 1980s and so on, I was trying to invent tools for doing science, ideas in science, ideas like computational irreducibility, ideas about symbolic programming and so on. And I thought, well, these are interesting, good ideas, but at some level, they're pretty obvious. One day, they'll be obvious to people. Well, the exciting thing is that there's now a generation of folks uh, for whom I think these ideas are obvious and where they're able to take those ideas and really leverage them and and move, move into the future. And... Uh, I think uh, James Boyd has has distinguished himself for being a, an energetic member of the crew for whom these ideas are, are sort of obvious and one is able to build on them. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, he's going to be leading our Wolfram Institute. And as I said, I will. I was going to talk a little bit about the backstory. Um, I'm looking forward to being uh, involved with the Wolfram Institute. And uh, uh, as um, uh, I get, hopefully, I just get to do research. And this is one of these cases where, uh, you know, I, I've spent more than half my life uh, CEOing things. Um, this is a case where I'm hoping I just get to do something I really like to do and which I think I can be very productive at doing, which is just move forward intellectual kinds of things. So with that, let me um, turn this over to James, who I think is going to talk about some of our uh, more detailed plans for the Wolfram Institute. All right. Thank you so much, Stephen. Well, first of all, I really need to thank Stephen for um, being a, an unfailing source of, of edification, instruction, and wisdom, um, both as a mentor and even more recently as a co-founder, as we've actually prepared to, to uh, launch this institute. So first of all, Stephen, thanks for, for all of your guidance, your support and your help and look forward to doing um, really powerful foundational science with you. So, well, everyone, welcome. Um, the Institute is launching today. So what I want to do is I want to provide um, kind of an overview of the objectives that are going to be guiding the Institute and um, 
somewhat brief descriptions of some of the projects that are either about to begin or that we plan to scope and launch um, in the short term over the next few months. And in closing, just to say a few things about the way in which we intend to actually approach science, with, we want to do science, and real kind of contributions to institu institutional approaches to science that I think that we can make that are, that are novel and that I hope will be impactful. So the first thing is that the goal of the Institute is to design, to execute, and to actually complete uh, computationally modeling projects that uh, build from, from firm computational foundations, new models for physical, natural, technological, and abstract systems. And really the key term here is computational foundations. Now, computation and computers are becoming increasingly uh, popular in the sciences. Many people use computers to perform uh, simulations and many people do study algorithms. So I would say that I still think that the, the actual notion of computation is sometimes still somewhat um, poorly understood. When, when we speak about computation and computational foundations, we're, we're really talking about the, the mechanical work that, that machines actually perform. You know, you, you give a computer some input, ultimately you are delivered some sort of output, but there's this whole entire process in between. And, and this, this process really is quite important. It's not really a, it's not an esoteric or, or an abstruse matter. It, it really is, really is quite core. You know, ultimately computers themselves, they are physical and this work that computers perform, it, it very much is a, a real physical process that happens. You know, the, the algorithm itself might be symbolic the output might be, you know, somehow digital or virtual, but the actual the actual computational process is real. It's, it's a real uh, physical thing that happens. And with the right computational language and with the right software, um, you can really capture um, many properties of the ways in which uh, computations actually proceed. You can make them computational themselves, and you can really study, you know, what happens when when computers um, when computers actually do something uh, that we ask them to do. And what we find is that these actual computational processes can be uh, highly unpredictable, they can be complex, they can be incompressible, and they can be, they can be irreducible. And that, you know, surprisingly, they actually happen to emulate or construct processes that we see in the, in the natural world. So you could use, for instance, a mathematical formula to describe some sort of process in the natural world, but with computation, you're, you're actually yielding um, you're actually yielding physically something that uh, that you actually see in nature. So in this sense, computation really is is really quite foundational. It's something that that you can use to actually grow, to generate, and to construct things um, from some sort of simple rule. Whereas in mathematics, you might be able to describe it, but you could never actually uh, create it, and you certainly could not. Um, you certainly don't have this kind of predictive power over the complicated and uh, unpredictable kind of subterrain from which, from which you actually get these processes. So, you know, what Stephen began to outline in the, in the 80s and the 90s was this kind of general methodology for actually studying computational processes, you know, as, as, as actual natural processes and developing this kind of experimental empirical framework for, you know, quite rigorously actually investigating the way that they perform. And, and as experiments, in the natural sciences, these are quite clean experiments, especially if you have the right software. You really capture all of the behavior uh, that you could that you could hope to capture. Um, you can use computation to um, really probe the depths of, of these processes, and, and you're not kind of losing anything to uh, to some some background. So it's a highly efficient way of, of of doing empirical work. But the other really exciting thing about computation is that you know many rules will yield processes that correspond to things that we see in nature. Other computations will yield processes that are that are entirely alien and, and unfamiliar. They could be they could correspond to laws of physics that inform other worlds, or they could un end up, you know, being used to design technologies that are that are entirely unfamiliar. So, as you know, as observers on on planet Earth, we see so many processes. You know, we see so many laws in our universe, but computation, all of the possible algorithms, all the possible rules. You know, they give rise when computed to, to all kinds of all kinds of forms of nature. 
And so with computation, we're really able to kind of mine you know, all, all possibilities, not only mine all these possibilities, but really actually see them manifested, see the kind of, see the kind of processes that they yield and see what those fruits are. And so you're able to import you know, alien worlds and alien technologies um, without, um, without you know, being uh, subject to intergalactic tariffs, which, uh, which I imagine would, would be, be quite high. So, so it's, quite, it's quite efficient in that regard. So this is a methodology that Stephen really helped to set up in the 80s and 90s. And since then, what we found is that with this new multi-computational paradigm and with this notion of the Rouliad, which really serves as this kind of synthetic theater in which you can study um, computations and multi-computations. Now we can study we can study individual processes, but we can also take entire families of rules or rules that correspond to many different uh, computations, and we can study these entire kind of systems of computations, not just one particular process, but entire paths of of processes that can correspond, they can interact, they can drift apart, and so with this with this kind of heightened capability, um, not only can we study computational behavior, but we can study kind of systemic behavior that's that's kind of synthesized from these kind of uh, basic uh, processes and how and how they interact with one another. So this kind of core foundational framework, where not only do we have this experimental approach for studying these kind of found, this kind of foundational uh, mechanical work that seems to underlie uh, all of nature, but we're able to you know take these kind of ensembles of, of, of machine work and, and really kind of glue and, and weave them together to form increasingly sophisticated systems. We believe that we can take this approach and now use it to model many different kinds of systems, including um, technological systems, but also in order to understand uh, with a greater deal of verification, um, abstract systems such as mathematics and, um, and even the universe and um, and, and the physical processes um, within it. So that's the that's the that's the kind of basic description I can give of the the kind of scientific legacy that we're upholding and the way in which some recent uh, breakthroughs and some recent adva advances have given us the confidence that we can really take this methodology of studying computations and now um, actually use them to to model the world. So. We tend to refer to the the study of rules and computational behavior as ruleology, and the use of the study of computational modeling um, to actually study kind of uh, the behavior of greater systems. We, we tend to call this meta modeling, and so these are two um, methodological um, assets. I say I would say that we've developed. I mean, I mean they've they've existed for some time, but we've really begun to uh, focus on them quite keenly and develop research programs that are going to, to em employ them. So that, that's kind of a summary of um, the method and this new kind of scientific opportunity that we see. And so I'll say just a little bit about um, specific applications uh, that we have in mind. So one thing that I, um, Nick, Nikolai Merzen, who is, who is uh, on this call, uh, as well as uh, uh, Stephen and myself, we worked on this meta mathematics project that was really intended to use this notion of multi computation of having many computational paths in order to model mathematics at a at a kind of higher level. And I think that at present, it's really necessary that we have some sort of a meta mathematical lens um, so that we can so we can understand the direction in which mathematics is being taken um, with with a kind of a, a greater vista with a, with a better perspective. I think for, for people who aren't um, often involved in the kind of highest level of pure mathematics, people might guess that really the role of mathematicians is to solve particular problems like you might do in, in middle school or in high school. But at this point, I would say that at the highest levels of mathematics, um, although some mathematicians do work on particular problems, really the goal of mathematics is, is to make it so that mathematicians don't have to solve problems at all. It's really about it's really not about solving particular problems. It's about inventing and developing abstract technologies that really automates and makes more efficient and more easy the, the solving of particular problems so that mathematicians uh, speak about mathematics uh, in, in much more general terms that kind of obviates or makes unnecessary having to solve 
in particular problems. So you can think about the kind of work that you did in mathematics, maybe as a child, as this kind of rather vulgar kind of uh, uh, manual labor that the kind of higher echelons of, of mathematicians would, would really not want to touch. They'd, they'd much rather come up with um, more sophisticated technology that allows them to, to kind of avoid that, that particular work altogether. So, I mean, one good example of this is um, uh, the work that Wiles did on, on Fermat's last theorem. You know, if you look at, if you look at the way that Fermat's last theorem is written, it's not as though Wiles spent eight years, like actually, you know, um, working on, working on the problem as it's actually expressed. In fact, he, he proves something completely different, which is the Tanayama Shimura Bay conjecture, which we know uh, has implications for Fermat only because of work that other people like, like Ken Rivet um, had done in the past. And so this is why having a meta-mathematical view is so important because the, really the future of mathematics is not solving particular problems. The future of mathematics is really having an almost kind of uh, cartography of these technologies that are being developed really understanding their internal mechanics, really understanding the directions in which, in which they can be taken, uh, really being able to perform diagnostics on them when there are um, aspects of them that are incomplete or, or underdeveloped. So really beginning to look at mathematics as more of an abstract engineering program, as opposed to a, a set of ad hoc problem solving efforts. This is really the kind of uh, next direction in which we want to take this. And so really the kind of um, apotheosis of, of of abstract technology building at the moment is, is definitely the, the Langlands program. The Langlands program is sometimes described informally as this kind of correspondence between uh, arithmetic and analysis, but, but it's not, it, that's, I would say that that's, that's too coarse of a view. Really what it is, is you, building upon works of people like Galois and Artin, there's this great kind of assembly line where you go from studying say particular particular polynomial equations, or you want to get arithmetic data about particular Diophantine equations, you really end up um, packaging that up in terms of Galois groups, in terms of matrix representations, uh, getting conjugacy classes and invariants, and ultimately getting some sort of kind of L function um, on the kind of arithmetic side. And then on the, on the analytic side, um, there's also quite a bit of packaging that's done in terms of uh, getting kind of subspaces of, uh, of, of complex valued functions that are invariant over, over kind of particular subgroups. These things are called automorphic, automorphic forms and getting L functions that correspond to those. And the kind of whole idea of the Langlands program is that you can take mappings um, or morphisms kind of on the, on the Galois group side and you can perform say base changes on the automorphic side and you have these L functions that correspond kind of functorially. And that might sound more or less like gibberish, but but the point is that the, the language program is really a kind of an assembly line um, for, for arithmetic that makes great use of, um, of, um, of, of analysis. And so, you know, I think Langlands used to occupy um, Einstein's office at, uh, at, at the Institute for Advanced Study and the language program is sometimes referred to as this kind of unified theory of mathematics. But I, wouldn't, I would say that instead of viewing Langlands as the kind of Einstein of mathematics, it's probably better to view him more as Kind of the Henry Ford of mathematics in terms of developing this kind of um, assembly line that makes uh, makes mathematical questions increasingly tractable. Now, of course, the great irony of Henry Ford's legacy is that you know he created this kind of assembly line, which was this kind of key place where you could kind of uh, cluster and concentrate uh, manufacturing so that it all kind of happened uh, together in one place in order to be efficient. And now, what we see with globalization is that. It's actually cheaper not to concentrate manufacturing in one place. It's better to kind of outsource manufacturing to other places. And of course, that's exactly what you have with the language program, which is you can try and kind of get as much efficiency as you want on the arithmetic side. But ultimately, you kind of have to outsource your questions uh, to, to arithmetic. So there's a kind of interesting correspondence between what you see in manufacturing, what you see in, in mathematics. You can really try and make an assembly line but ultimately you might have to actually just outsource it to a completely different province within mathematics. So the goal here is to use this multi-computational approach to really be able to map out this kind of space of mathematics, these different kinds of provinces, these different areas, understand these kind of abstract technologies that have been built up, understand the dependencies and, and really start to kind of study it um, with, that, with that kind of higher level view. So that's one example of something that we'll be doing in, in meta-mathematics. Another important question in mathematics is um is not this meta view where you look at it um 
from the from the kind of highest vista possible, but actually really trying to understand what's underneath mathematics. I mean, one thing that's kind of funny about uh, about say any any theory in mathematics, be it group theory or monoid theory or uh, or ring theory or something like say uh, Boolean algebra, is really you just begin with some some axioms that are more or less posited, and then you study what the consequences are of those axioms. And of course, that's exactly what we do when we study. Um, when we study simple rules and their behavior, it's exactly what we do in the physics project where you begin with some rule and you see what kind of candidate spatial structure um, gets grown from there. So once you have a kind of really logical view, axioms start to appear increasingly arbitrary. I mean, it's, it's known that axioms are somewhat arbitrary, but they're used because they're, they're quite high performing. So the question is, especially from our point of view, when you become accustomed to actually growing sophisticated structures from computational foundations, the question is whether or not axioms themselves are, are even fundamental or if there are if there is kind of more primordial or um, or simple machine code from which you can get axioms and so this project is called sub axiomatic foundations um, some progress has actually been made in this area already so Stephen wrote actually he wrote a whole book on on combinators which are very formal systems that historically actually precede um, Turing machines and what Stephen uh, found is that you can actually get these combinators, which are these very simple formal systems that happen to emulate um, uh, operators in, uh, in 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 Boolean algebra. So you know, NAND, XOR, implies, etc. There are they're kind of combinator versions of these. And so what we want to see is that for for kind of these arbitrary um, theories or axiomatic systems, you know, trying to in general be able to to develop um, functionality that allows us to um, emergently construct axioms from underlying machine code and then and then really understand what what the behavior is um, of, of those of those particular combinators so with multi-computation for instance it could be that there are actually multiple uh, multiple kind of interacting computational paths um, or entire kind of rule structures that underpin mathematics and then the question is you know what do those look like what kind of properties do they have? And is there some sort of kind of um, symmetry breaking or something underneath underneath axioms where you have this machine code that gives rise to mathematics, but it itself does not actually follow any mathematical properties since it actually kind of precedes um, the mathematical effort altogether. And that actually brings up this kind of greater point, which is, um, so with the Rouliad, the, the idea behind the Rouliad is that with multi-computation, you can take a rule, you can take several rules, you can kind of pair those rules together, you can take an initial condition, you can take several initial conditions, and then you can, you can run those rules. Those may evaluate um, along multiple paths, and then you can examine their behavior. So in principle, there's a limiting condition in which you can take many rules, you can take an infinite number of rules, you can take many initial conditions, you can um, you can take that asymptotically to an infinite number of initial conditions, and you could run this for, for infinite time. And then you would get this kind of maximally interconnected um, computation, kind of synthetic computational space. Now, this might sound like a kind of a, um, a somewhat irrelevant um, Gedanken experiment or, or um, kind of hy hypothetical exercise, but it's actually quite, it's quite helpful to think about multi-computation this way because you know what it suggests is that no matter what kind of multi-computation you're doing or whatever computation you're doing it's somewhere within the Rouliad there'll be some other computation somewhere else and the kind of space between those computations is also some structure within the Rouliad and so as we do uh, these different modeling exercises if we want to actually build from computational foundations if we want to kind of proceed from Rouliology from the study of simple rules to their modeling behavior it's quite helpful to have the Rouliad as this kind of um, intermediary structure where ultimately the Rouliad should really proceed in terms of your scientific explanation, the Rouliad should really be able to proceed what it is you're modeling and you should be able to explain how whatever you're modeling, you're really ultimately able to get it from these kind of Rouliad foundation. And so I'm, I'm particularly excited about that kind of um, that kind of approach because it involves it involves kind of an architectural view and it, it requires um, the kind of uh, boldness to really invent a number of, of new concepts and a number of new frameworks. I can't help but be reminded of, uh, of the mathematician Alexander Grotendieck, who he was at um, IHES in France, and he was, he was kind of a, a, a maverick there at the time. 
and someone had kind of complained to him that the library at IHES was uh, was somewhat kind of underpopulated and, and didn't have enough books. And Grotendieck just said, you know, we don't read books, we, we write books. And um, this, this approach is not always appropriate, but I would say that for something like Google Foundations, um, it, it, it really is, it probably really is the right kind of approach to take. So of course you can import concepts from say mathematics to work on this new kind of foundational area, including work that, that, uh, that Grotendieck did like Grotendieck's homotopy hypothesis. But ultimately what we're going to do with science is, uh, is really dive deep below models that exist and explain how they arise um, from the Rouliad, from multi-computation, from higher structural features in the Rouliad, which are being explored by um, in areas such as end machine theory. And that's going to involve, that's going to involve quite a bit of, of new invention. Now, but once we get from Rouliad foundations and we start to do meta modeling, then it requires uh, you know, intense research and understanding people's work and trying to understand how we can both emulate existing theories from Rouliad foundations, but also identify opportunities to make important contributions that other people will find useful. And so like a key example of this is physics. So obviously I should say something about physics. So the physics project is going to be housed under the Institute. So the physics project was launched in 2020 and there was quite a bit of exciting work that was done actually before I entered the picture that was done in 2019 and 2020 on the, on the physics project. Now, one issue that we've had with the physics project is that um, it, was, it was launched and there's quite a bit of excitement behind it, but we really didn't have a, uh, a firm um, institutional kind of setting um, that we could use to kind of accelerate the physics project. So the physics project, I mean, thankfully the physics project um, has continued for, um, for the last two years, thanks to um, volunteers at different universities and people working, full, uh, people working part-time. But now with the Institute, we're going to have physics fellows who are really working uh, full time on, on advancing this, this computational framework. Now, I'll say just a few things about the physics project just kind of for review. So I would say that, I mean, there, there are many aspects of the physics project, but there are kind of three key assets that are, that are quite exciting that we've kind of inherited from work that's been done in the past. So the first is that we are able to generatively construct these kind of emergent candidate spatial structures from, from simple rules. And we're able to measure uh, certain properties that they possess such as their dimension and their curvature. The second thing that we're able to do is to obtain corresponding multi-computational structures or multi-way system. So if you have some simple rule and it's being applied to this candidate's spatial structure, if that spatial structure is kind of sufficiently sophisticated, then that rule is actually gonna apply in many different places. And so you can kind of disaggregate the application of that rule into this kind of threaded you know, multi-computational structure. And there are different kinds of structures. So you can have structures that are that are oriented towards the states, and you can have structures that actually look at the applications of these rules, which we, we happen to call events. And so now that we've kind of disaggregated the application of these computations to these spaces into these kind of uh, different evaluation paths, the idea is that this puts us in a better position to study uh, both relativity and, and quantum mechanics. Um, so, um, so for instance, um, actually, no, I should say, this actually leads to the kind of the third key asset, which is um, because we're modeling these multi-computationally, um, we're also able to kind of endogenize or internalize observers themselves uh, within the model. So the observer is not treated as something that happens outside. The observer is, is really something that is uh, put within. And I'm, I'm not sure where else this has been done in physics. I know that John Wheeler had something called the participatory anthropic principle, um, which kind of hinted at this, but I think in general, this with multi-computation is, is quite a new advance. So if you take if you take the example of relativity, we'll have these causal these multi-way causal graphs that show the applications of these rules to different parts of your spatial structure. And so you have time proceeding in a downward fashion, and you have you know these kind of distinct uh, parts of space laid out along these these uh, space-like hypersurfaces. And what you can do to model an observer is you can take these things that we call foliation, where you kind of slice up this uh, this space-time causal graph in a specific way, this will give you a particular reference frame. And the nice thing is that because no matter how you slice up, no matter how you foliate this multi-way causal graph, the actual time-like separated order between the events is preserved. And so you get the nice property of Lorentz covariance. In the, in the quantum case, there are kind of similar parallel arguments made that we can use foliations to study quantum, quantum observation, that the kind of non-commutativity of these different evaluation paths in the multi-computation 
could correspond to um, you know non-commutativity of operators in Hilbert space, um, which is essentially how uncertainty principle is formulated, and that we can do things like perform path counting on these paths that lead to particular states in order to get, say, quantum 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 amplitude measurements. Um, so that's just a little bit of a kind of a, a key summary for people who are maybe not that familiar of some of the of some of the major assets that we're going to be leveraging as we continue to develop the physics framework. The really the, the next step is to take the work that was done in 2019 and 2020 and make it increasingly computational to kind of fill in um, areas that that were somewhat underdeveloped and make it so that we can take you know a given rule and look at the space uh, that it constructs, look at the corresponding space time behavior and increasingly uh, push towards uh, something like quantum field theory and general relativity. And because there is um, this, this um, there are these hints of this correspondence between the way that you can model uh, relativity and quantum mechanics through multi-computation, you know, a kind of increasingly rarefied um, uh, treatment of QFT and GR should, should be able to align in a, a theory of, of, uh, of of quantum gravity. And so here, the, the crucial thing though, is that we both want to be able to emulate existing uh, uh, theories and fundamental physics. We also want to be able to make no novel contributions. So just to take, just to take you know, one example, if you look at theories of quantum gravity, you know, a key distinguishing feature between say loop quantum gravity and something like super string theory is, is background independence. You know, are you basically assuming that there's a, a background space time, or do you actually have to construct it yourself? And so with string theory, for instance, you basically just presume it. If you look at something like the Nambu Goto action of a world volume in string theory, you know, the target space time is just this Ramanian manifold that's basically, it's just given there. It's just, it's just there like a, like a Christmas present. You just kind of get it for free. Uh, but what we should be able to do is to create, um, create theories where you actually do construct the, the background. So you don't just get the Christmas present of, of space time, you actually play the role of Santa Claus and, and you actually build it yourself. So with, with computation, Santa Claus becomes real in physics. Otherwise, you're, you're basically just uh, acting as though you get something for free when, when you don't. Another, another really important um, contribution that we can make, for instance, has to do with the, the cosmo cosmological constant problem. So if you're familiar with this, you know, basically when we, when, we, uh, when we consider, say, the vacuum energy density, of the universe, obviously, you know the, the, uh, the, the kind of the, 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 the vacuum is not not actually empty. Um, you you all you always have kind of virtual particles that are kind of popping in and out of existence. So there, there's always there's always some there's always some vacuum energy. The problem is that the uh, the discrepancy between observation and theory in terms of estimate for the cosmological constant can be as wide as 120 orders of magnitude, which is a, you know, 10 to the power of, of 120. And when, when you're off by uh, 120 orders of magnitude, you're not off by a billion, you're not off by a trillion, you're off by, actually, I looked this up on, on Wolfram Alpha last night. It's like November trigon trillion or something. I mean, it's like a, it's like a number I've never, never even heard of before. And so like, you know, only in, only in physics could you make a, could you make a, a mistake by an order of 120 orders of magnitude, you, you definitely couldn't do it. Let's say if you were working for a central bank and you told the you told the IMF that your GDP was was one trillion trillion dollars when it was actually one dollar, you'd probably be dismissed as a central banker, at least probably in in, in most countries. Um, so it's a it's a very significant issue in in physics. And what I you know I think one prospect here is that you have the theoretical estimates and then you have observations, but actual computational experimentation can be used as a kind of insertion between the two of these because it is it is experimental but it is still based on um it's still based on some sort of formal construction that we do and we should have a way to always be able to compare the computational structures that we get you know against against mathematics and the good news is that um Whereas in observation, it's very hard to get the small scales. When you're constructing something emergently, you actually start from the small scale, like inevitably where you have to begin. And so, um, you know, studying things at the small scale is something that the physics project is kind of, uh, kind of well suited to do. I'll say one other thing, which is that, you know, another kind of key aspect of the study of observers um, is, is the question of something like the Fermi paradox, which is, you know, where is everybody 
Um, why is it the case that humans appear to be uh, relatively alone uh, in the universe? And um, I think that our, our work on observer theory, especially within rural foundations, can make important contributions to SETI. Actually, I would say really um, that SETI, SETI itself at the moment does not really exist as such because most people have really no way to, um, to really interrogate the I in SETI to have a kind of a non-anthropocentric notion of intelligence. Mo most work on SETI today is either really astrobiology or um, kind of philosophical work on the Fermi paradox, which, which does happen to be quite good, but um, it doesn't necessarily lend itself to, to the study of, um, to actual kind of um, experimental study. And so, you know, when we look for things like techno signatures, we have terribly anthro anthropocentric views of what techno signatures could be, things like Dyson spheres or von Neumann probes or Kardashev civilizations. You know, those things are all kind of informed by not only our technology, but our kind of contemporaneous uh, understandings of technology. So what we should be able to do from royal foundations is we should be able to internalize our models of observers, you know, within within the Ruliad, within royal space. And if you have a way of kind of coordinatizing different observers, there's always going to be some sort of royal distance between them. But that royal distance is still some sort of a multi-computational end machine or or computational structure. And so trying to understand, you know, how you can actually um, pass something that is invariant or receive something that's invariant, you know, within this kind of greater computational space. I think that this is really the step forward for SETI because you you afford a kind of a non non -anthrop non anthropocentric um, model of the observer, and you also have some sort of a way to kind of measure just how distinct observers are. And it's inherently computational. So for SETI and also METI for understanding how to receive and, and send uh, signals, I think that this really is our, our best shot. It's still not, it's not, still not well formed. A lot of work still has to be done on Rulio Foundations. And we will have Rulio fellows um, who, are, who are working on these questions. And for those who are interested in working on this or, or sponsoring it, you know, I, uh, I welcome you. Um, sorry, I just gotta. We'll also be working on um, a number of other projects. So things like economics, molecular computing, evolutionary biology. I would say in economics, again, the notion of the observer becomes quite important when looking at say questions of bounded ra rationality. Um, Multi-computation should be very important in studying say um, models of exchanges. And what we should really be able to have there is a model of exchange that extends all the way from kind of studies of, um, of, of kind of the emergence of exchange in anthropology all the way to say the kind of market making that, so, that uh, someone like Citadel does and, and kind of everything in between. Um, with computation, you know, you're able to kind of meta model things uh, generally. And so we really should be able to go all the way from kind of, you know, the study of, of spheres of exchange amongst uh, subsistence farmers uh, amongst the TIV in Nigeria, all the way to understanding um, how, how how market making and and, and pit traders work. Um, we're going to be working in molecular computing. Um, I'll just say something quickly about molecular computing. I mean, um, nanotechnology, molecular technology, molecular machines. Um, these are the subject of many publications today. But I would say that really the kind of the radical vision that really carried some conviction was probably the vision that was advanced more in the 1990s, um, which was, you know, general purpose uh, molecular manufacturing, um, nano computation, and this kind of advanced general purpose nanotechnology, not like, you know, these kind of carbon nanotube tennis racket um, plays that we see kind of today. And so the kind of key issue with molecular computing, though, is that um, when it was originally advanced, the idea was to have um, highly stiff kind of covalent structures um, that had a kind of a diamondoid or machine phase like character to them where through, yeah, like diamondoid mechanical synthesis or atomically precise um, manufacturing, you were able to effectively um, eliminate all degrees of freedom at the nanoscale besides um, the particular operations that you wanted to perform according to your engineering design. And so this was a, this was a quite constrained um, um, approach to to molecular nanotechnology. You know, Feynman famously said, you know, there's plenty of room at the bottom, 
Um, but there's also kind of a, in more political terms, there's kind of a, a power vacuum at the bottom. We really can't control things that well at the nanoscale, which is why, um, um, you know, the, the kind of the first push was really to have something like um, totalitarianism really at the at, at this kind of nanoscale really control things uh, quite precisely. And of course, there's no no ethical problem with that. But the real problem is that it's just very, I think it's very difficult to maintain. So what we want to do is, you know, we understand that um, molecular behavior um, is, is, is effectively multi-computational. There are all kinds of things that can happen at the molecular scale. And what we want to do is instead of trying unduly to, to constrain it completely, to really understand how chemical and molecular processes, um, how they proceed multi-computationally, trying to actually extract kind of motifs um, and um, to kind of topological or graphical behaviors about how these things behave, and then to construct an ontology that can actually be made programmatic and can be used for molecular computing. So instead of trying to unduly kind of constrain the way these processes work, really try and instead um, observe them and try to extract a kind of an abstract view of them and then be able to use those for, uh, for molecular computing. So that's just a, that's a, a somewhat uh, brief overview, maybe not so brief of some of the things that we'll be doing at the Institute. I do wanna just say a few things about the kind of approaches that we're going to take um, to science. So above all, the Institute is going to be done for public benefit and we're adopting an open science approach. And so, you know, one way in which we'll be do doing open science is that we'll be uh, live streaming many of our meetings, the meetings that aren't live streamed will be recorded and recordings will be available on our archive. Our code and our notebooks will be made available through an archive on our website as well. Um, our functionality will be available on the uh, Wolfram function repository, which you don't have to wait for, you know, some new update of the Wolfram language. You can just, um, you can, you can access that functionality immediately and anyone can, can contribute to that. Um, another important thing though, is that we're going to have um, publications that are available freely to people. And so, you know, in kind of, uh, I like to think that the Institute adopts somewhat of a kind of a startup culture when it comes to science, in the sense that we have a small team and we're, we're working very intensely on making very significant impacts to, uh, to these areas of science. We're taking unconventional approaches, um, but we also want to be able to engage with uh, people who are interested in our work, with our supporters and with our community kind of as, as directly as possible. So we'll have, um, we'll, have a, you know, we'll have a Discord channel, we'll have many social media channels and we'll have ways to interact quite consistently with supporters. We'll also be doing that on areas such as Twitch but we'll also be using things like our Wolfram Institute bulletins, kind of like as, as MVPs in the sense that are minimum viable products, as they say in the, in the startup world. Whereas as soon as we have a kind of a sense of how you know, a certain aspect of the theory can be put together, we'll release a bulletin in order to kind of showcase these ideas, share them with people, get feedback, and kind of continue to do this iteratively in order to kind of, um, to, in order to kind of build this up. We think this is kind of a better approach than um, say publishing in journals, which can which can take uh, which actually take years to get published, is quite a glacial process. But also, we have the technology stack to do something that I think is also kind of better than what is on what is on offer from archive, because we actually have the ability to do computational essays. So we have some bulletin, or in the future we'll have kind of computational essay journals where you. Um, you're able to take, say, a graphic or a table or a numerical result that was produced by a computation, and you can actually just extract the code um, just in one click from um, from we what we have available online. So we have uh, we have the techno techno technological capability to make our results uh, highly reproducible and to make it quite easy for people to to build upon them. And so there are kind of new standards that we want to set, and actually how we distribute um, our results, how we how we kind of deliver them to to the public, and you know, as a, as a as a nonprofit, we'll consistently look for new ways to sustain ourselves, both through uh, contributions from our founding donors, but also by um, increasingly kind of monetizing the science that we're doing and using Web three opportunities uh, to explore that. But the kind of the key the key constraint here is that um, at the moment, yes, scientists are. Um, economically, financially, not terribly independent. They're largely dependent on government agencies. 
or universities or, or particular grant makers. And I think part of the problem um, behind the, the absence of a kind of a, a kind of a capitalism of science is that um, scientists usually do not meet a, a significant demand, you know, especially at the, at the forefront of science, you're usually doing work for, for, a, hand, for a handful of colleagues. The, the size of the demand pool is really not that high. And so one thing that will really have to happen in order for science to become more independent is for scientists to actually do things that the public actually cares about, that people actually respond to. So the first step is really to you know, do all this foundational science. We're answering questions that I think people really do care about, like where do things come from? You know, Yes, any scientific theory can get to some level, but below that, it's not able to explain anything below it. We really want to be able to kind of build up these explanatory frameworks all the way from the ground up from computational foundations. So we really want to engage pe with people and get people interested in our work. And we think that that kind of gesture, that kind of effort to actually um, work with people and to um, you know, respond to their curiosities and to kind of in indulge their interests, that's probably the first step towards actually making science independent. Before science can become independent, it really has to be open. It has to become important and relevant again. And scientists have to be able to be willing to, um, to kind of intermediate between their colleagues who are subject matter experts and kind of general public interest. I think that's really the step forward to, um, to making science more of a kind of independent and, and interesting effort. So that's a, that's a very quick overview of some of the projects that we're doing and the kind of way in which we want to, uh, way we want to approach science. Um, so now at this point, I think, um, what we'll do is we're going to transfer to more of a panel format. So first I'll introduce um, um, Carlos. So Carlos is a metamathematics fellow at the Institute, and he's also agreed to help with community outreach. So Carlos is actually going to be moderating this panel that we're going to be holding. And so the panel will include, um, uh, will include Steven and include me, but, but importantly, they include uh, several of our associates who are going to be um, working in a way that's kind of affiliated with the Institute. And this includes uh, Bob Metcalf, uh, Greg Chaitin, and Philip Rosedale. I think that uh, Carlos can kind of set up the panel and uh, provide the necessary introductions and get the conversation going. But we're really hoping to, to learn from, from uh, these gentlemen. They, have, they each have uh, quite distinguished careers and they all have interest in science and in science that overlaps with the work that we'll be doing at the Institute. So anyway, thanks for thanks for listening to me. I look forward to continuing to engage with you all. Um, I'd like to thank Wolfram Research for hosting this launch event on their on their social media platforms. I will say that we are going to be um, transferring institute uh, meetings to our to our own social media platforms. I'll say more about that at the end. Um, but anyway, thanks to thanks to Stephen, thanks to uh, Wolfram Research, everyone behind the scenes who's been uh, helping significantly with the launch. And uh, to our associates and to our fellows for attending. And Carlos, please uh, go ahead, take it away. Thank you very much, James. Well, um, hello, everyone. Um, pleased to be here. Uh, I, I loved when James referred to uh, one of the approaches that, to science in the Institute as abstract technology. Uh, I, I do like to think of myself as an abstract technologist. I think it's the, more than a mathematician. I have mathematical training, but I think that's how, how, how I see myself. So, um, I'm just here to moderate and to uh, ensure that there's a, a healthy conversation going between our um, senior associates of the Institute. So uh, the first thing, instead of just uh, me saying uh, the accolades and the, and the uh, long, uh, interesting, unique careers of, of, of you three, um, I, would, I would ask you to highlight uh, what you think is uh, the most relevant part of your biographies in relation to the Institute. So maybe Bob, you can go first. Me first. Uh, I'm beginning my uh, sixth career. Uh, these are 10 year careers. My sixth career, I'm calling uh, computational engineering. And right after deciding all that, I learned there was this thing called the Wolfram Summer School. So I attended it this summer uh, for three weeks in Champaign. And I've become a fledgling computational engineer uh, appointed at MIT. So I'm, I'm now a research associate in the uh, CSAIL, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT. And, uh, but I live in Austin, Texas, so I'm busily trying to figure out how to uh, 
to be uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Champaign, uh, and uh, uh, Austin, uh, all at the same time. My initial engagement uh, is geothermal energy. I, uh, just to get started, I thought I would solve energy, the energy problem by exploring uh, a very promising space called geothermal. And uh, what I've been learning over the last few weeks is uh, uh, I'm not the only one who's had this idea. And uh, they, they write papers, they write papers like this uh, on this uh, on this topic, which is how what are the various architectures for drilling geothermal wells and how do those architectures compare and contrast? And so I've, I've begun work on that, which means I have to learn thermodynamics. So I'm in the middle. I've read the book Thermodynamics for Dummies. So I'm uh, getting started in thermo. I'm hoping not to have to learn linear algebra again. Uh, my um, that was 50 years ago. Okay, uh, did I did I answer your question, or should I say more? I think that's fantastic. Uh, perhaps you can say what uh, in relation to the institute that we're launching, how how you see your experience and and how you see this initiative uh, in relation to your long experience in many institutions. Well, I, I buy the idea that we're entering a new paradigm uh, about which I know very little. And as part of my sixth career, I hope to learn a lot. Uh, I've been a, uh, a dabbler in uh, um, Wolfram software for uh, you know 20 years. And I, I, uh, my, during my three weeks there, uh, I got a lot better at it and hope to... Uh, apply it more effectively. My, my emphasis is, is, on, is on architectural variations rather than optimization. So a lot of the people involved in modeling are focused on optimization. But I've had a very positive experience in using uh, computational methods, not for optimization, but for just discovering whole new ways of doing things by very simple models that uh, uh, you can easily contrast. So, for example, the internet at its core has a bunch of stuff related to backing off. Ethernet had a back off. I invented Ethernet. And one of the things in Ethernet is a back off algorithm. But that algorithm, the, the notion of back off has propagated from Ethernet up to TCP. And it's propagated again from TCP up to Wi Fi. So, the, uh, and, and that whole notion of backing off was a result of a computational process. I was, simulating how Ethernet might work, and I realized you needed a back-off algorithm. So um, that, that's sort of what I mean by uh, not optimization, but uh, architectural or discovery-oriented uh, computation, not optimization. I have to jump in and say that it's my, it's my meta-hypothesis that uh, a lot of these kinds of sort of distributed computation algorithms can be better understood multi-computationally. People have said, let's do a Monte Carlo simulation. Let's simulate one particular thing that can happen. I think there's probably a lot that can be learned from looking at the all possible things that can happen situation, which has always seemed too daunting for people to tackle. Point one. Point two, I'm still convinced that you're going to invent the ethernet for geothermal energy of figuring out how to get uh, whatever working fluid it is to be sent in packets down deep into the earth and come back up again at at, uh, at higher temperature. I think that's a, you know, I think that's more than anything, as 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 you've told me about it. It's a, it's a it's a kind of computational architecture problem. Well, we've heard about it first here today. The idea of geothermal packets. I have not formed that phrase previously, uh, but now I have a new goal. Yeah, the pa the, the internet is basically. Uh, packet technology and now we can include geothermal as soon as we discover what these packets are these geothermal packets yes bundles of energy i do want to say that we, we will be doing a project on multi-computational modeling of distributed computing that wasn't just some some idea that stephen happened to come up with though he does he does do that um but we will we will have fellows to work on distributed computing and really we'll begin that as soon as we get as soon as we get funding and as soon as we find people who are interested. So if you're interested in doing either, um, you know, feel free to contact oh, us. Yes. And yes, I look forward to seeing the GeoNet. Yeah, that, that'll, be, that'll be cool. Oh God, you guys are coining terms faster than... 
<laughs> the GeoNet. Oh my goodness, a natural. All right, Bob, thanks very much. Uh, perhaps we can turn over to Greg. Uh, so a couple of points about your biography and how you relate to the Institute, the defaults are welcome. Okay, uh, hi. Hi everyone. Um, I'm um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, um, I met Stephen just about when he first arrived in the United States, um, and um, I've had the privilege of seeing the whole arc of his career from relatively close by, and it's been very inspiring. And I'm delighted that you guys are creating this. Uh, uh, this fantastic um, institute. You know, when when I see all the, well, Stephen is enormously hardworking, but when it inspires so much hard work and enthusiasm from young people like you, it means something important is happening. And uh, I certainly agree that you can't do this in academia and you can't publish in conventional journals because the inertia in academia is is, um, you know, like trying to push a continent. And um, so, okay, about my own research, um, uh, I go back a long time, believe it or not, before there was complexity theory. And I was um, a kid in high school, and I took a look at time complexity and program size complexity and some other complexities. I decided that the interesting complexity from the point of view of deep mathematics was program size complexity because I could apply it to define randomness and to get all kinds of incompleteness results. So my interest is principally the philosophy of mathematics or the limitations of mathematics. And I know a lot of you are interested in mathematics with new tools and new approaches, which I think is wonderful. I want to say I'm very disappointed with the world of physics. Um, you know, there's really been no new idea since the 1920s, it seems to me. And um, I was very disappointed with the way string theory suppressed all research on alternatives um, until I heard uh, that, that Stephen's approach can combine general relativity with quantum mechanics sort of effortlessly, which I thought was just a great piece of news. So I think we really need to try new approaches. We need to break out of this. This the, the establishment will not really permit any anything new. And um, it's great that you guys are making your own institute with a whole different approach to everything. And uh, I'm sure you're going to find a lot of fascinating stuff. So uh, um, that's the message I wanted to give you guys. Yeah, we are certainly very excited about the discoveries that lie ahead. Um, so, uh, Philip. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. Exciting to be here. Uh, well, I work, I'm an entrepreneur with a background in software. Uh, I've worked on virtual worlds my whole career and things like virtual economies and all things like that. I, I'd say before I uh, talk about what excites me, you know, at this moment uh, about the Institute and about working together, I, I would say that, you know, my career as a young computer program, very young, you know, middle school computer programmer started when I found a, a, a paper from Stephen in the back of Scientific American talking about uh, his 1D automata. And it, it got me, computers were, of course, so slow at the time, it, it motivated me to learn assembly language on an Apple, which was a, a big moment for me, probably that probably the next big moment, you know, to uh, you know, hats off to Bob Metcalf was was uh, just getting out of college at the very beginning of the consumer internet and being able to apply myself to you know moving packets around between tons of computers rather than what you could do on one computer. But um, so it's really fun to be here with with both of you in the same space. Uh, yeah, I've worked on virtual worlds my whole life. I, I started uh, Linden Lab, which is the company that made the virtual world Second Life, which is you know very much still uh, up and running and a kind of a terrarium for all kinds of experiments in how people uh, uh, come together in online spaces and use them. Um, I've had an interest in uh, computation and in simulation, at least primarily because of that, the question of like, 
if you're going to create an interesting virtual world, uh, the virtual world, in, in my opinion, and I think in many others, should have some sensible uh, rules by which it operates. And so from the very start of Second Life, I was you know, deeply interested in using computational simulation of some kind to make an interesting virtual world. And so, of course, that you know, kept me uh, up to speed on what uh, Wolfram and, and Stephen were doing and, and, and writing about all that. And it was one of the real influences on the kind of way things work inside Second Life. Uh, and so in that regard, I think applying um, this latest way of thinking about computation and multi-computation and applying it to things like simulating stuff in virtual worlds uh, continues to be one area of interest that I, I, I hope to uh, work together on. Another more recent one has been the dynamics of economic systems within virtual worlds. And I suppose, you know, one might say, or, you know, as, as a cousin within cryptocurrencies, um, Second Life has an unusual uh, monetary policy and way that the currency works inside it. And most recently, I've become fascinated by the question of what can be generalized from those learnings. And then this question of, um, broadly digital currencies and how we build digital currencies given that we can build so many different types of currencies now that are for example uh fairer with respect to wealth inequality as they grow and change over time so i've done some you know modeling of that recently uh and i i think that the kind of techniques here um would would apply very well to uh, to, to learning new things about economics and about communities and how communities use money um, so that's a couple of things from me. Thanks. Great to be here. Well, that's fascinating. Um, in fact, uh, I think we, we will tackle these kind of ideas, both in terms of research and in terms of our direct engagement with, with the systems themselves in, in terms of economics and how we fit into the, into the scientific and, and intellectual ec ecosystem right at, at the end of the day. Um, so it's, it's very fascinating. So at this point, I thought I would open up the conversation. Um, Anyone present here uh, can go. Probably Stephen has a lot of thoughts and, and replies to what have been said. Uh, otherwise, feel please feel free to, uh, to reply to each other and, and further conversation. Gosh, don't know where to start. So many interesting things to talk about. You know, I, I think. Um, uh, let's see. Who who'd like to? I mean. Maybe we could discuss, maybe James has some things to say about uh, um, some of the near-term projects and, um, uh, you know, I think what one thing that's, that's um, um, uh, both Philip and Greg have been much involved in kind of the, what I might think of as the philosophy of computation. I'm not sure they necessarily would 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 identify with that, but I think that's a that's a theme. I mean, when I hear about uh, Philip talking about the fact that uh, simultaneity inside a um, uh, sort of peer to peer virtual world, it's all easy until you have the actual outside human observer who has mm -hmm. to tell what happened. That's deeply reminiscent of of a lot of the things that we see in quantum mechanics and other places. Um, and I guess I'm uh, I'm also somehow in in Greg's work on metabiology and kind of the um the sort of uh, the um the progression of competition among programs so to speak i kind of again wonder uh what uh, th this process of competition it's kind of uh, there's 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 somehow an observer in this picture because when things compete what counts as the winner is somehow something which has to have some kind of uh you know external observation to define what what counts as the winner and i, I suppose i i'm i'm um I'm sort of trying to trying to understand well I, I suppose a recent a recent interest of mine has been um oh I'm, actually i'm going to i'm going to ramble into thermodynamics here because i happen to be in the middle of a project to uh uh try and tie up what is the second law of thermodynamics? Why is it true? How true actually is it? And how can it be generalized? And somewhat embarrassingly, and, and Bob is, gives me a hard time about the fact that he's older than I am, but I still think of myself as old. Um, I started working on this um, 50 years ago, 
when I was 12 years old. So, so, um, and uh, I've kind of <clears throat> uh, now trying to sort of finish off what I started more or less 50 years ago of understanding the second law of thermodynamics and understanding that it is a deeply computational statement. The second law of thermodynamics, the statement that entropy tends to increase, the statement that things tend to get more random, that's a statement, I think, of the comparison between us as observers who are computationally bounded and the underlying systems that are computationally irreducible. So you've got all those gas molecules bouncing around and doing these sophisticated computations. And all we can say about them is to us, it all just looks kind of random. Um, if we were more sophisticated observers, if we were observers who could sort of trace all those computations, it we would no longer say, oh, it just looks kind of random. We would talk about all the details of what the molecules are doing. So the thing I realized is that actually uh, the second law of thermodynamics, people came to believe that it was just true and provable as a matter of mathematics. Actually, the history of that, I, I've just recently been tracking down, you know, in the 1860s, when the second law of thermodynamics was being developed, people in developing it kind of assumed molecules existed, but we don't didn't know yet that molecules existed. Then people develop the second law of thermodynamics, 30 years goes by, everybody's arguing, do molecules exist? Does this make any sense? Then it turns out, yeah, molecules really exist. Mm -hmm. And so then people said, oh, that means the second law of thermodynamics must be absolutely true. And it was proved 30 years ago because there was this, you know, it depended on molecules and now we know molecules exist. This logic is not correct. And the second law of thermodynamics has situations in which it is undoubtedly true for gases observed by certain kinds of measuring devices. It also has cases where it isn't true. And I wouldn't be surprised, talking of, of Bob's story of, of uh, fluid dynamics and transport from and geothermal transport and so on, that some of these things where you just say, oh, this is, you know, let's work out the entropy. Well, you know, entropy for something like a turbulent fluid is not a terribly useful concept. There's a lot going on in a turbulent fluid, not well captured by just saying, oh, it has a certain entropy. That's that's the 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 um, uh, and I think you know these places where the second law of thermodynamics doesn't really apply, I, I I think might end up being relevant there. I might also say that that talking biology, um, the question is, for example, what phase of matter is biological tissue? It's not really a liquid. What we've increasingly learned in molecular biology is that things are uh, remarkably orchestrated. You know, you look at all these processes with enzymes and proteins and filaments and the cytoskeleton, all kinds of things like this. Molecules are being moved around in what looks like a machine kind of way. It's not just a liquid with things bouncing around randomly. And I think what turns out to happen, what I found actually back in studying cellular automata back in the 80s, these class four cellular automata that have these localized structures and so on, they look, I had originally thought, oh, they look like kind of large scale life, but actually they look even more like what's happening in molecular biology. And I think there's this kind of different phase of matter that I've sort of been starting to call the last few weeks, the mechanoidal phase that um, uh, is the sort of the bulk version of what life is doing. Of course, the part that I don't know, and I, I'm, I'm very curious what the, what the sort of relation between that kind of bulk view of, of what life might be doing and any of these questions about sort of evolution and the competition between different kinds of organisms and so on. Anyway, a few, a few rambles trying to, trying to pull together some of the things um, you all are talking about. Yeah, how, how exactly are we gonna, we're gonna find the intersection between metabiology, uh, simulation design and, uh, and, and kind of networking architecture. I think, this, I think this is the kind of discursive uh, challenge we have at the moment. I, I will say, I mean, not, I, I'm not going to eat Carlos's lunch, but I, I think I might encourage Philip to say something here, though, because I did happen to visit Philip um, back when I was still in California, and I was happy to see him. I mean, Philip, Philip does understand this observer theory. Um, um, because he's had to have. live it, because he has he's had actual observers. <laughs> well, in his, well, in his but, but, what, world. but what's interesting is that, of course, so he understands he understands it from the implementation side, but he also understands it from the theory side. Which is, you know, that was a pleasant surprise that I found when uh, when I visited Philip. So, I mean, Philip, we've kind of discussed this a little bit, but I think um, let let's see, let's see, we can we can begin with simulation design, and then let's see if we can uh, we can generalize this to competition between programs and, and network computing somehow. This will be a fun a fun associative exercise, I suppose. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I think that, uh, as you said, I've, I've had to live, the experience I've had that's been interesting has been trying different things and then in many cases watching the social response to them of people, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm struck by the stuff we're talking about, like Stephen was just talking about entropy, you know, if you, if you build a deterministic reversible automata that is the virtual world, right, then you can't manipulate it as external observers. It's just running. You, you can't do anything. You know, you build a game of life, it just runs. Uh, if you, you know, if you click on things and you make changes, then you have this fascinating thing going on, which is the people on the outside, the humans that are interested in this virtual world are coming in and mucking around with it. And from the vantage point of somebody situated within the virtual world, right, they, they would look like a sort of noise, I suppose, coming into the system. And so that's always a fascinating thing to to talk about and think about it. I've thought about how, you know, one of the challenges with virtual worlds right now is that they're not yet widely used and everybody debates, you know, laughs at Facebook with their latest stuff or whatever, you know, like has a big exciting conversation about when and why virtual worlds will become compelling. But I think one of the interesting reasons is this concept of how the observer uh, 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 sees and interacts with the world and how that meshes with the other observers. And I think there are, there are ways in which you can do that right and wrong. If you do it wrong and we're all sort of confused by the interactions we're having with each other in the virtual world, it, it's, it's boring and we tend to leave it. If it's over constrained where, you know, someone controls everything that's going on and you can do almost nothing then it's boring, you know, you fall out the, you fall out the interest, uh, set on the other side. So, uh, I don't know how that connects, but there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot to talk about. It's, it's a little bit shocking in a sense. I mean, you talk about sort of the miracles coming into the, into the virtual world that come from outside the rules of the virtual world. And um, uh, yet, you know, we aspire to have a theory of physics where there are no external miracles and where we, right. uh, so it's in a sense, we're living the life of a, of an AI avatar, so to speak, inside your virtual worlds. And yes. one question would be, what does it feel like to be that AI avatar inside the virtual world? You're not looking at it from the outside. You're actually living in the virtual world and experiencing it there. Do you have any any sense of, I mean, have you have you tried to live as a as a as a sort of um, you know, as an AI avatar in one of your virtual worlds or anything like that? <clears throat> You know, I think that a lot of people who do spend a lot of time, I mean, as, as you may know, uh, some of the people that spend time in Second Life, for example, really do pretty much live their lives there. And so when you sit and talk to them about the experience that they're having, yeah, you know, they come up with a lot of things that are interesting to think about and then to work on. Um, you know, one is that predictability and control is, of course, often pleasurable, right? Like if you're in a world where when you move something, it moves the way you thought it would, that's quite nice. Uh, and so I think when you're alone in a virtual world, you have this, you know, solipsistic ob observer experience where everything does sort of work according to your predictions. And then that is, uh, m for many people comforting, you know, it's a reason why they like being in virtual worlds or even like wearing VR headsets, you know, but then you get into this problem that as soon as you encounter other people, just as you said, Stephen, you know, those other people look like these sources of noise. And of course, because we don't yet have, for example, the ability to see people's faces when they walk up to us as avatars, uh, we are uh, surprised by things that they do in ways that we wouldn't be if we were together in the real world. Um, yeah, you know, I, I have the suspicion that computational irreducibility is not yet a big enough thing in the kind of modeling infrastructure of these virtual worlds because computational irreducibility pr continually produces surprises. You can't know, you know, our, with our finite right. minds, we don't get to know what's going to happen next. And so it's going to be a surprise. I mean, forget the idea of having sort of truly external noise. I mean, this is, you know, Greg and I have had this discussion for decades about, you know, is the universe like pi or like omega? Um, you know, pi <laughs> being the thing that can always be computed and omega and Greg's, you know, fundamentally non-computable constant. Um, uh, you know, is it is it the case that that in a sense? And so so, uh, you know, my my belief, you know, even with pi, because of computational irreducibility, there is much that you as a as a human in the situation cannot readily predict. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's but I, I do really wonder, I mean, I you know, as we as we talk about kind of observers and we dig into observer theory, I'm 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 trying to get a better feeling for what it's like to be a computer, so to speak. You know, what is the, you know, we uh, I'm 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 sort of uh, 
um, uh, you know, how, how is it different from being, uh, you know, how different is it or not from being a person in the world today, so to speak? You know, un underscoring what you just said, Stephen, I think one of the reasons video game design will now be an interesting topic as we talk about something like computational irreducibility is because we're getting to the point where we have enough compute power to make the, say, the interactions of things in video games complicated in ways that now become material. You know, you can say that is in fact quite irreducible, where historically you've looked at stuff that was visually, visually suggested richness, right? But the actual environments are not in any way simulated. And so they're incredibly boring to us. You know, even though we see a video game like Grand Theft Auto or one of these what, what are called open world games, that when you look at them, and they and the designers do a wonderful job of this they make it they make you feel like you're looking into an infinity you know into a space but then of course when you actually look at how things interact unless you're looking at something like a crazy minecraft build you know where kids will go in and build a working computer in minecraft or something most video game environments are extremely uh reducible and, and very easy to predict but i think you're right it's going to be important as we gain the ability to create unpredictable systems to really understand that irreducibility and make sure that it's irreducible in the right ways when we're manipulating it. And As to opposed build to on that, I mean, I mean, one thing that I think, Philip, we discussed um, when I visited you before is that also as more virtual worlds are created, you know, there's a question of who, who gets to edit the virtual world, who gets to actually make changes, who gets to inform uh, the way in which these are designed. And there is a kind of um, almost, I don't know if you want to call it a, a governance issue or an architectural issue, but there's the issue of, you know, multiple agents who are able to kind of contribute and inform the way that these, these, uh, these actually run. Because one, their choices will be irreducible, but they'll also make, um, they'll also make, you know, different choices. And then you don't want to have some sort of, you know, phenomenological anarchy or something where your simulation is kind of reduced to mush because it's informed by too many different kind of competing decisions. If you can tell, I'm trying to push this towards uh, Greg's notion of competing of competing uh, uh, computations here. The notion between um, kind of governance on the one hand of actually designing um, simulations and perhaps not just uh, irreducibility, but really multi-computational irreducibility between you know not only the consequences of one agent's choices, but of, of many agents' choices. And also you know, the question of whether or not you know the kind of pressures that are being contributed by different agents can result in some sort of a, a nice simulation that might be the kind of equivalent of um, of getting some sort of evolutionary fitness because of competition between uh, between different programs. Maybe we should study um, only children. You know, there's a certain set of pathologies related to growing up alone, and then you leave home, and suddenly there's other people. Uh, interfering with your life. So, so I'm suggesting a look at the literature on only children. Interesting. It's, uh, it's great. We might even ask who here was an only child, but uh, let's, <laughs> perhaps we shouldn't do that. Oh, when you're an only child and you leave a toy over there, when you come back, it's yeah, still yeah. there over there. But if you have a brother or a sister, there's no, you can't rely on it being there. My children are fighting all the time. They're five and almost three. And one of the causes of frustration for my little boy is that he has his various design projects or artistic projects, but then his little sister <laughs> undoes what he's doing. So he tries to develop places to hide things at home. So, so in the Chaitin household, there's irreducibility because there's a because there's a, a, a another computational agent in the in the picture, but but you know I was I was thinking where where James was going um, is you know for for Philip there's sort of you say I want to govern this virtual world I'm going to make a constitution for this virtual world all will be good I know what's going to happen you might say <laughs> but then Gödel's theorem reaches in yeah. and says. Well, actually, you can't know what's going to happen. I mean, that's sort of a a computational irreducibility story, and and I guess I'm I'm sort of curious in the actually this sort of relates to all three of you. It's kind of like you set up rules, and uh, you know the what's going to happen is the is the internet going to crash? Is you know 
is is it going to be the case you know how how far can you reach i, I was uh, and you know is it to what extent can i mean how do we resolve this question about we want governance yet we know fundamentally we can't have total governance so to speak how should we resolve that I mean, in the case of the internet, the ethern ethernet and so on, turns out it worked okay. Just like lots of things I've built in, in you know, engineering I've done. It's like you try this thing and, well, okay, I have to ask Bob, did you know it was going to work, the whole exponential back off thing? Did you know that that wasn't <laughs> going to cause, you know, at some point in the future, the giant internet hurricane that was going to, you know, from some unexpected, you know, cascade of events and so on, that it wasn't just going to all come crashing down? No, we knew it would work. We simulated it and the simulations demonstrated that it would work. And the source of resilience was knowing that you don't just get one shot. You, you get as many shots as you want. So therefore you can eventually succeed because you're in, in the case of ethernet retransmitting but in the there are many other examples where as long as you have the option of trying over and over again eventually you can succeed i understand that argument however this is the you know i'd be curious in in for example greg's response to that because in a sense you know this is sort of the the theory of bugs the theory of uh, the unsolvability of the halting problem the theory of Gödel's theorem, for example, is yes, you can give those arguments and you can give some, but do you really know that there's no possible configuration? When you do a simulation, that's a particular instance, a particular set of random numbers that got chosen. The question is, you know, how do you know, for example, for example, how do you know that there isn't an adversary who can, you know, just poke the internet in just the right way and have your exponential back off algorithm just come, come crashing down? Or, or more to the point, more you know, more elaborate routing kinds of algorithms, which I guess are, are, are perhaps less robust. Just sort of curious how that um, uh, how that works. Oh, we seem to have lost Greg. Uh, some something you see that this is maybe that's just what happened here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, well, you could bring down an Ethernet with a pair of pliers. You, yes, you just cut it like this, and it's it's broken. <laughs> It, it's interesting to think about exponential backoff as a kind of a social contract amongst all of us using the internet, right? Because as we know, we can exploit, uh, we can not back off. Uh, sadly, I must say, as a young younger man, I, I knew a lot about this because I was the CTO of Real Networks, and we were sending UDP packets that carried audio and video. And in many cases, we either didn't back off right, or we didn't know how to do it well. And and, and of course, we often look back to your, you know, to the references behind us, but we were, you know, doing something different, sending media, but. The, the, the internet exists because we all collectively obey a uh, you know a set of algorithmic in some case ideas for example back off right that causes the whole thing to work provided we obey those those those, those sort of governance principles right so people cheat uh, you know they don't they don't obey the back off they they seek advantage in the back off vulnerabilities and that's happened many times but we we've struggled is is Greg back? We should ask him how, why we lost him. Was it a back off <laughs> failure or what the heck was that? <laughs> um, yeah, I'd be, I'd be curious to, to hear his uh, thoughts. Let's see, maybe we can reach out to him and. Um... Can I, ex I'd like to ask, this sounds mundane, but can you tell us anything about the institution of the, of the Wolfram Institute? But what is the Wolfram Institute? Is it a, is it a corporation? Is it a partnership? And where does it get its money? And the, is there anything about this institution that we're all now falling it's in a, love with? It's a 501c3 uh, entity that is part of the Wolfram Foundation. Um, it might split off as a as a separate entity from the Wolfram Foundation at some point, but right now it's part of the 501c3 entity that is the Wolfram Foundation. Um, we've been, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, Nick, Carlos, Wukash here are um, our first crop of fellows at the Institute um, and we'll be adding more soon. James has been the one at the front lines of that, very actively making things happen. Um, the, the, these folk will have the good fortune of being able to do full-time research um, under the uh, 
uh, in the framework of Wellcome Institute. Um, it's primarily a virtual organization for now, although James has been has arrived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I'm in the Boston area. And um, you know, we have some some micro office space, and uh, we intend to actually start doing actual in-person events in addition to virtual events um, through the institute. Um, and uh, we are we are very grateful for our first crop of um, supporters, donors to the institute, and um, we uh, uh, at at some uh, my theory. James can say his version of this. You know, we, we've uh, uh, we've got an, a, a nice initial uh, starting uh, set of set of sponsors. We have a lot of potential growth, but I'm glad that we're starting off comparatively slow because we're uh, we're you know th this is this is a um, uh, we're we're you know if we started with 50 people, I don't think we would necessarily know how to make that work in a streamlined way um we'll be uh, we'll be scaling up to uh, quite a few more people very soon um and that's 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 the basic setup am i right james uh, you see yes yes that's 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 more or less uh, the right the right description so some of us aren't fellows and what is the expectation for us Right. So with our okay. So actually, I'll say I'll just say one thing about the about the the donor question. Yeah. So we've had we've had a, a few donors, including Stephen, by the way. I mean, St Stephen has made has some significant contributions that really helped towards uh, the launch of the institute. So including Stephen, the other donors have not yet been announced. So I, I won't actually um I won't actually name them, but um we've secured enough donations to begin the meta mathematics and physics research uh, in full. And I agree that if if we had you know, receive some lump sum, and that we, we were under some pressure to build a larger team. I don't actually think that that would have that would have been fortuitous. So we have we have a we have a relatively small team. I am continuing to onboard some people for um, for uh, physics fellowships, and we are also actively looking um, for Ruliad fellows who are interested in studying kind of pure multi computation Ruliad foundations and helping to create more. Uh, framework and functionality that can allow us to uh, make this bridge between kind of the study of ruleology of simple rules, multi-computation and these different meta-modeling efforts uh, that we're undertaking. Now, there are some more projects that I do want to launch, say, within the next few months, and those are distributed computing, molecular computing, and economics. And that depends on uh, receipt of funding from, from donors and also from new fellows. So for anyone who's listening, if you're interested in this research, either participating in it, or contributing to it, um, you can uh, you can contact us through the Wolfram Institute website. That's wolframinstitute.org. That that institute is uh, is available uh, live. Sorry, that was a little, you you asked for it. That was a little bit of a just a, a little advertisement. Um, now, as for as for the associates, yeah. So we have, I mean, so we have fellows. Really the, the 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 role for the fellows to fill is to do this research on a full time. Uh, paid basis. This is something that we haven't had available before. I would say that's really one of the key uh, functions that the that the institute is going to serve. As for the associates, so we invite associates um, really for for two reasons. One is that they we you know we we happen to to know them and we know that they have research interests that that do overlap with ours. And also they've had some sort of distinguished career, which has given them um, insights or experience that we think can be helpful as, as I continue to kind of design this institute and make choices kind of on the methodology side, on the program design side, on the community building side, um, et cetera. So, you know, these associateships are, each of them is quite uh, personalized and flexible. I mean, I, I'd like to think that, especially as we have fellows who are doing work in different areas, metamathematics, evolutionary biology, distributed computing, observer theory, that, um, that, they can they can look to you in part for um, for some feedback when we have you know particular um, I mean we'll have meetings all the time but when we have particular meetings when a fellow has a kind of a major update of course we invite our we'll invite our associates to kind of sit in on that panel and weigh in and ask questions this is I think a good fresh way of getting feedback it would be bad if the fellows were just getting feedback um, from me or or from Stephen I think um, let me maybe add something that yeah. we we sort of yeah, forgot yeah. to mention okay. Hmm. Um, we have also a lot of students who are involved in one way or another 
with our projects and with the Institute. Uh, we have this wonderful, uh, in addition to sort of the, the world at large and all the people who contact us, we have this great pipeline, two great pipelines actually, of very talented people, our summer school, which we've been, Wolfram Summer School, which we've been doing for the last 20 years, um, as well as our uh, high school summer camp. And, um, and, and all, as well as our, our winter school, which we've been doing about physics project for the last couple of years. And um, uh, uh, multiple people, uh, of, of, yes, in fact, our, our complete crop of, of Wolfram Institute uh, folk um, are, are sort of graduates of our, of our um, uh, summer school. Um, and uh, we have really a, a terrific group of people and we've had a, a research affiliate program um, uh, for the physics project for the last couple of years, and that's being folded into the Institute and students involved with the Institute. And one of the things we're, we're hoping for some of our senior associates who are interested, we do have a, a great collection. In addition to our fellows, we have a great collection of students who are interested and very, you know, energetic and actively working on our kinds of topics. It'd be great if, if our senior associates were interested in interacting with some of those students that's sort of at a different end of the career spectrum from um, uh, uh, from from uh, those folk, but that's for me at least. I find it super invigorating to um, <laughs> interacting with students who are kind of in early stage. And I know we have, um, uh, for example, I think right now I, I don't I haven't really been keeping track of this. I know um, we've got uh, a couple of high school students who are very um, energetically contributing to our projects, as well as a bunch of college and graduate student um, folk. Um, I think we also should also mention that we intend to have a program uh, whose name I've already forgotten, which is um, uh, there are a whole collection of mostly academics who have interests that intersect with the things that we're doing at the Institute. And um, uh, we want to have a, a good structure to interact with those folk. And um, we'll be kind of, I think, announcing some some of those uh, those folks soon. James, do you want to maybe talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So first I'll say something about the research affiliateship program. So um, there are a number of uh, individuals, most of whom are also alumni of either the summer school or the winter school or whatever future schools we have, like the, like the you know, spring elementary school uh, camp or, or whatever we continue to do. We have, there are more months and, there, and we can get younger and younger, I think. So there's, there, maybe there are still schools that will happen in the future. But um, right now they're, they're either summer camp or summer school um, alumni and they're, they're in some university setting. So they're not eligible for any kind of full-time fellowship. They are interested in what we're doing. And what we're doing this year is um, if they have an advisor or if they're a little younger, they have you know a, a teacher with whom they, they interact closely and they have their permission um, and they're interested in doing some kind of academic research that engages in a serious way with say the physics project in particular that um, we're going to have particular teams and groups uh, for them they can work on some project that uh, makes an important uh, contribution to the physics project so um, just as we'll have meetings with our individual fellows where the fellow has some important you know, contribution or finding to share. We'll also have these team meetings for these research affiliates. And yes, and we'll, and we'll also have um, adjunct scholars, people who are, um, who are, who have some academic position and they're interested in, in a collaboration of some kind. It could be writing some sort of a joint paper or organizing a conference, um, something of that sort. So, you know, in general, the, the senior associates, I would say that um, we're really excited to work on, you know, um, areas of research where we have mutual interests. So with Philip, um, observer theory and, and simulation design, as well as uh, new kind of um, new kind of currency design and how that relates to multi-computation with Bob. I mean, every, everything from, yes, from the GeoNet. Inventing GeoNet, uh, to, inventing yes, GeoNet. I, I think GeoNet and, um, and I mean, really. Is thermodynam that, thermodynamics is physics, isn't it? <laughs> Well, it's supposed to be. So the new kind of physics might bear on my project since I'm involved with thermodynamics. Oh, yes. The most exciting thing to me is the following observation that that, you know, thermodynamics, the, the operation of the second law of thermodynamics is a story 
of computationally bounded observers interacting with computationally irreducible underlying behavior. That's what leads to the second order of thermodynamics. What's really interesting is that same thing is what leads to general relativity and to quantum mechanics. They, they require a bit more assumption about how the observer works, but they come from that same interplay between computational irreducibility underneath and boundedness of the observer um, in terms of how the thing is perceived. And the thing that to me philosophically is really exciting thing, which I'm sort of really internalizing these days is people believed that thermodynamics was sort of provable from in a sort of mathematical way. You just prove the second law of thermodynamics. But people thought that things like general relativity and quantum mechanics were in a sense wheel in theories that they didn't, there was no, nothing underneath them. It was just like, well, they happen to be true. You could have made a universe where they weren't true. It's, it's kind of like a contingent thing that you could just wheel in, wheel out. I think that's not correct. I think they all come from the same thing. They all are come from essentially observers like us observing the Rouliad, observing this sort of space of all possible computations. And they're in some sense, they're all the same theory. And to me, and that means that they, that quantum mechanics and general relativity will be, in a sense, as provable from the Rouliad, given the characteristics of observers like us, as thermodynamics is provable. And by the way, thermodynamics isn't provable without an assumption about the observer. You know, back in 1865 or so, James Clerk Maxwell, who I'm very impressed with, came uh, wrote this lovely book about thermodynamics. And its second to last chapter is about his so-called Maxwell's demon, which was about something, it's, it's sort of reminiscent of packets somehow. It was about this, this little demon who has this uh, barrier in between, uh, you know, in, in, in some container that has gas, two kinds of gas molecules in it. And the demon, whenever the demon sees, you know, an oxygen molecule, he opens this little trap door and makes it go one way. Whenever the demon sees a nitrogen you know, molecule opens the trap door and makes it go the other way. And so the demon succeeds in sorting the air into a separate container of oxygen and nitrogen. Okay, that in complete violation of the second law of thermodynamics. And so Maxwell explains, you could have a demon like this, and then the second law of thermodynamics wouldn't be true. Okay, now, then, but but then people basically ignored that possibility. Why aren't there demons? People would argue, oh, the demon creates entropy by having a flashlight, by, by uh, erasing its memory, things like this. I don't think any of those things are correct. Um, I think that, uh, and in fact, what's amusing is in the last even few weeks to months, there's papers being published in physical review letters and other physics journals in which people are constructing Maxwell's demons with electronic circuits and things like this. And it's a slightly more complicated story. What what the ultimate story of the demon is, if you try and make a demon out of the same stuff that the demon is operating on, computational irreducibility bites you, and you can't do it. I, I will just say about Maxwell that um, uh, you know he almost made to me like a a, a a very you know it's a very nice treatment of of Maxwell's demon and why the second law might not be true. And as I mentioned before in a strange episode in the history of science, all of that why it might not be true got forgotten when molecules were discovered and it looked like it's it's got to be nailed. The only thing, there's a little bit of a downer, is the very last chapter in his book tries to explain the phenomenon of the fact that there are only a discrete set of possible molecules. And, you know, there's nitrogen, there's oxygen, whatever else. Okay, so he's writing his book in the 1860s, just a few years after Darwin's Origin of Species was published in 1859. And so Maxwell has this last chapter who says, well, I think there might be distinct species of molecules for the same reason that there are distinct species of animals, which of course we don't know why there are. But um, so, so that, which of course is complete nonsense. That, that's not, uh, you know, but he didn't know molecules existed. So, so it's, it's always interesting to see this history. By the way, this whole question about why there are discrete species of animals is something else that we think we might have you know, biological evolution has never had an underlying kind of formal theory. It's, it's, um, uh, and we think the whole sort of multi-computational approach has the possibility of providing that kind of underlying formal theory. I think, um, but, but yes, therm thermodynamics is um, uh, the thing, I, I mentioned another thing, you know, for example, Kelvin was very big on the, um, 
uh, the idea of the heat, actually, even even though Boltzmann as well, on the, on the the idea of the heat death of the universe, that in the end, everything in the universe will sort of run down, and everything everything that we care about, that we think <laughs> of as mechanical work, will have been turned into heat, and at that point, there'll be nothing interesting left in the universe. Well, this is not right, because heat is all these detailed motions of molecules, and it's only because we're kind of dumb, aggregative observers that we think there's nothing interesting in all of those random, seemingly random motions of molecules. In fact, in the actual evolution of the universe, those seemingly random motions of molecules will be informed by the whole history of our civilization. And it's just because our current capability as observers can't sort of disentangle those motions and we just think of it as, oh, it's just random heat. That's why we would think that there's sort of this heat death of the universe, which I don't think is necessarily irrelevant to the kinds of things you care about with, with this geothermal uh, energy problem, because I suspect that this whole question about what exactly can you get from a fluid that is supposedly operating thermodynamically. Thermodynamics is this approximation appropriate for certain kinds of observers. Now that we have, and that's what you learn from all these papers that people are publishing about Maxwell's demons every week now, what you can actually, by using modern sensors, actuators, and so on, you can do things that seem to be thermodynamically impossible. And so you can, in a sense, live the Maxwell's demon, so to speak, at least uh, in, um, you know, we can't, we can't get all the way because of computational irreducibility, but there are certain things we will be able to do. Like, for example, in turbulence, you say, well, turbulence is random. I don't think turbulence is that random. There's undoubtedly a lot of reproducibility in turbulence. <clears throat> also a question of is, is turbulence kind of like pi or like omega, but but it's, you know, I think it's it's more like pi. And that means that one could imagine something where, you know, you think there's sort of turbulent flow <clears throat> of whatever else. Well, actually, you might be able to have some little device that sort of digs into the randomness and is able to sort of uh, uh, do things that seem to be impossible if you just assumed it was random. I mean, I, I think this is like, and, and uh, Bob, you could comment much more on this, but I mean, like people always used to say, you'll never transmit data. Actually, I, I'd be curious what you'd say about this. I mean, back when I was younger, people said, over copper wires, you'll never be able to transmit data faster than 1200 board. Well, there was a bunch of Shannon theorists who said 14.4 was the peak. But on the same day, you could buy a 50 kilobit per second modem, uh, which is, as you might imagine, is quite a bit faster than 14.4. But they were just assuming that it was really old copper. They forgot that there was a lot of new copper around. Was that the issue? Or was it an issue of how the signals were encoded and what kinds of, you know, what kinds of modeling of the noise could be done? I believe it was just not uh, incorporating uh, all the new copper there was. I bet Philip knows something about this from his life in, as a UDP packet maker. It's funny. I can remember getting one of the first 56 kilobit modems and trying to use it with the hope that we'd be able to send more audio and more video over it and finding that, you know, most of the time the darn thing would downgrade to 21. <laughs> it would, it would, it'd be, and as Bob said, be, because of the line conditions, it would start off with a brief moment of hope where we could, you know, send high, high, high quality music and, and then it would renegotiate back down to lower than the one before. But to Stephen's point, yeah, Bob, I think there's, there, there are, there have been changes in the, uh, uh, modulation and encoding schemes, right? That let let the systems get faster and faster to, I guess, the yeah. physics limit or whatever of the information. I mean, my impression has been that the the major thing that's happened is successful modeling of noise. That what what used to be thought of as noise, and, and this again would be a Maxwell's demon type story. What you thought of was, as noise that was just random, you were being buffeted around by it actually turns out to be something where you can make predictions about if it's if it, there's this noise happening, this is going to happen next and so on. And mm. then being able to use that um, and sort of navigate around it to be able to send data. Um, that's, that's my impression, at least. The, you know, Je Greg, Greg, you, you, you missed a, um, uh, um, we were, we were talking about kind of the, the governance of things like virtual worlds and the idea, that, or the internet for that matter, and we were talking about, I was kind of uh, uh, um, tweaking Bob on the question of 
could the internet just crash because of an unexpected consequence of the algorithms that are used to, to run it? And we were talking about um, you know, the relationship of that to Gödel's theorem and uh, other kinds of, um, you know, in other words, you set up the set of principles for how the internet is supposed to work. And then in a sense, Gödel's theorem is almost saying there will always be an unintended consequence. There'll always be something that you didn't expect, some bug that you could not predict, so to speak, will always be out there. Yeah, another way to look at it is to ask, is the system creative? Uh, is the system creative? I'm afraid my children have just arrived and before it, it was, uh, I didn't have internet, but now. Hello there. <laughs> but now, Clarina, Clarina, can I just, I'm gonna have to log off at this point. Clarina, can I show our little girl? Everybody, here she is. Hello. Well, I, I, I better, I better get off here, or all will, will ruin your meeting. Okay, so it's been a great pleasure, and all, all the you. best. Thank you so much, Greg. Yeah. It's a Thanks. Pleasure. Bye. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. <laughs> Take care. Yeah, Bye -bye. I think we. Thank you. Schedule, I think we're, uh, we're yeah, we're just slightly now running over uh, the the allotted time for this. Um, not to, I mean, again, not to play Carlos's role for him, but um, maybe just to, to somewhat wrap up the discussion, I actually, I, I wanted to ask Greg his opinion, but of course, I guess there'll, there'll be another opportunity, but, you know, Bob um, and Philip, um, I guess, based on your experience, I mean, Bob, it could be, it could be with Xerox Park or, or you know, I guess any, anything that you've, that you've really done, um, and Philip as well, based on your experience with Linden Labs, um, Second Life, High Fidelity, et cetera. I mean, you've heard you've heard a little bit about what we plan to do in terms of uh, the running of the Institute. I, I didn't say actually as much about uh, how we actually plan to execute the research. I did say something about the kind of community building effort um, that we plan to undertake. I will just say something about the research side, which um, in, in case it wasn't you know made obvious by what Stephen said and what I said, is that we have, so we have these fellows um, met, some of the fellows um, have some experience working at the company. All of them have experience working at the summer school. And so they're all familiar with the notion of doing, you know, focused, you know, goal oriented research. It's, it's basic research, it's foundational research, but it's computational. It becomes concrete. You know, you work with your, your teammates, there's some management involved, and ultimately you you achieve some sort of uh, really, really interesting result, and you do, you do things with computation that that was not possible before. So you know we have we have these two goals: one to to yield really new exciting results, and also to share them with people, get people excited about science again, help to kind of mend scientists' public relations, which I think are are quite um, um, quite badly broken at the moment. And so these are these are some kind of two dual goals, and I see um, what you have done, Bob, and what you have done, Philip. As, um, as 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 exemplary on, on these kind of two respective fronts. So you know we're about to we're about to have some some institute meetings kind of later later this evening. I mean, as as kind of associates people who are working with us, are there any kind of key you know key lessons that you you've learned um, on on these two respective fronts? And is there anything that you'd recommend you know for me or for for the fellows or for for Stephen or or anyone else? Well, science, science doesn't need to be defended as much as it needs to be fixed. What do you mean by that? All this energy goes, you know, there's all this whining out there about how science is out and, and all these people are doubting the experts and it's a yeah, yeah. terrible state of affairs that science isn't held with such low regard by people. And then the response is to defend science and say, no, science is great. Everything's hunky dory. You guys are stupid for not believing it. That's the wrong response. Yeah, the correct response is to fix it. Science is substantially broken. There are a lot of non-reproducible non results floating around out there. Papers being withdrawn. Uh, the corruption of the cor uh, corruption of the peer review process and blah blah blah. So, so my my gut reaction to the way you pose that question is. Yeah, focus on fixing science, not on defending it. I mean, you can defend it if you want, but the emphasis no, but, but, should be but fixing. Bob, I, 
I, one of the things that's really great about that, there are a couple of things that are kind of unique about things we've been able to do. One is the whole computational essay, computational language story means the whole methodology is out in the open. Right. There's no, you know, there's a zillion times I've read papers and it's like, I'd really like to figure out what these people did. I don't know what the heck they did. You know, I'm doing a big reverse engineering project yes. to try and figure out what they did. You know, I can't reproduce it. I can remember in the early days of neural nets, actually, I remember I was trying to reproduce these results in this paper. I still don't know if they were right. The, you know, in because and one of the things, you know, I've tried to do in the stuff I've written, for example, about the physics project, every picture. You click it, you get code, you can run the code. If the code doesn't produce the picture, we have a horrible bug, but hopefully our automated testing is preventing that ever happening. But that means, and that, you know, if you look at our summer schools and winter schools and so on, what a lot of the projects do is they start from exactly that code that you get by clicking a picture and and, and using the code. And that's a very, it's a, it's a thing that just isn't possible in non- sort of computationally language informed science to really yeah, build yeah. this tower where you, you know, every picture, you can start from the picture that person made in their paper and you go on from there. You're not going back to try to reverse engineer and start from scratch. That That's one thing that I think is, is, um, uh, is important. I think that the- oh, Excuse me, so a goal, uh, one of the goals of the Institute is to Promote. Um, I want to choose my words carefully here, but promote the use of CDFs instead of PDFs. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So I mean, these, part, these, these, part of the open of the, science idea that we, we heard earlier. Yes, yes. I mean, look, I, I've been I've been talking about computational journals for forty years, and it's like people haven't been doing it. You know, they haven't been. You know, it's still the case. Well, we have to figure out why and fix it. But well, yes. we don't have to figure out why. We're just going to do it. I mean, this is something that we will be doing. Uh, yeah, we at, lead at by example. We, we, in the yes, right. This I mean, I want to. In this direction in science, it's all going to be computationally based, and the things we do will have this feature that that people can just directly build on them computationally. And I think that's um. So you know, that's that that's an important element. I, I think the real reason it hasn't happened. I think there are a couple of reasons. One is. Uh, it's easier to spin words and have them be sort of okay than it is to write a piece of computational language and have it actually run, thing number one. Thing number two, and it's, uh, you know, when somebody says, can you really justify that result in your paper? People are like, oh, well, you know, we got this data and blah, 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 blah. It's off in some corner somewhere. The, the, you know, this idea that you'd actually expose the whole thing and everybody else could get those same results. That's an idea that for both reasons of competitive pressure in, in academia and for reasons of it's just so much trouble to really bulletproof the thing to make it be the case that it really is reproducible. I think those have been the, the primary sort of things that have, have slowed that down. And I think we have the opportunity to, in what I hope is, is an increasingly you know, major initiative and area in science to just say, that's not how we're gonna do it. You know, just like, when you know when the Journal of Nucleic Acid Research insisted that every paper that reports a genomic sequence should deposit the actual data for the genomic sequence in the central database, you know that was what started the whole sort of genomics story, and you know that was a that was a small case of this. But I think in in the you know the convention of that field became you put your sequence in the central database. That's how and and that allowed the field to progress in ways that other fields have, have just never been able to progress. So I, I, I think that's a you know, that's one thing. The other thing that I think is is pretty interesting is this open science approach of doing things like live streaming our internal discussions, live streaming. I mean, I do some sort of absurd levels of live streaming sometimes. Like, like one thing I've taken to doing is when I'm working on projects, even just by myself sitting there for six hours in complete silence, I'll record, you know, I'll screen record everything I do. And, you know, and we post a bunch of those screen recordings. I, I don't know if anybody ever watches them, but one thing that I do know has happened is people will say, how did you get that result? You know, where did that come from? Well, if you want to, you can peel it all the way back and you can see that moment in that screen recording where, you know, where I made that horrible mistake that caused me to conclude the wrong thing or whatever else it is. It's completely transparent. It's, um, you know, the there's no, 
oh, there's a mysterious thing. You'd have to go ask that person and maybe they don't remember anymore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, and I think, so, you know, this idea that sort of the science process is fully out in the open is I think a pretty interesting one. The other thing is, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I know, you know, I've been doing a bunch of live streaming of our software design reviews, as well as our science research uh, kinds of activities. I don't think other people have had the, I don't know whether it's the nerve or the, the insanity, so to speak, to do that. But it's a pretty interesting process and it allows much more engagement of, of people, I think, with, you know, it's not just science is happening behind closed doors and somebody's going to deliver the answer. It's, you can see it being done, you can be involved, you can make a contribution. It's, it's a, I think it's a, I hope it's a, it's a sort of attractive way to kind of uh, open up the process of science and not just say, an expert has said this, you know, believe it. And that's all there is to, to say about it. It's like you can you can see, you know, the the experts, so to speak, in in some of the things we do, the experts may violently disagree, and you can watch that disagreement. And uh, right, but so the institute should have a, this conversation would suggest that the institute should have a, on its to do list is improving the tools for openness. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean. I would say that the, the purpose of the Institute is not to defend science. I mean, the, first of all, you know, attacking science with rigor is really the most scientific thing that you can, you can do. What we want to do is we want to radically improve science and to transform. Now to Stephen's point, when you do science from computational foundations, I mean, the first thing is, you know, um, going back to everything that I said before, I think that, in I think that paradigmatically and methodologically, it really is the best way to get a, a deeper explanatory framework for what you're modeling. But there's this added bonus, which is when you do everything computationally, it's very easy to share it with people. It's very easy to do a screen share on Zoom and have everyone follow what you're doing. And it's very easy to archive all of your results. And it's so, not easy enough. <laughs> well, actually our, our infrastructure is, is really, um, is, I mean, in terms of the click to copy code that Stephen had described before, and in terms of what we're doing on the archiving side, I mean, it's pretty easy for us to to. I share think we should listen to what Bob say. is saying. He's right that, that you know it's it is fairly easy, but it's probably possible to make it easier. And it isn't something we've particularly focused on. I mean, because we know we can do it. The question is, is it? Do we make it easy for other people to do it as well? And and, and the Wolfram set of tools is way ahead of everybody else. And I've just been through that process. I can verify that. Uh, Thank you. Yes, I mean the terrible thing is that that you know it, you know as we progress both in the tooling and in the science, there are lots of things where we kind of feel like, well, we're fifty years ahead of the pack. Fifty years is so long that it's really non-trivial to get you know that artifact from the future and make people understand it today, and that's you know that and people you know there are these things where it's it's a paradigm that you know, will be well understood at some time in the future, but isn't yet today. It's only understood by some very, some some small group of people. And and how you kind of, you know, introduce new paradigms and have people really understand them, that's, you know, that's a very challenging thing. And I think we're, you know, what we're trying to do with the Institute, among other things, is to make it at least possible for people to grab onto these paradigms and not something that, you know, where, where it's as kind of open and easy as possible. But but look, I I think the um uh you know for example we've been trying to invent how should computational journals work and we need to figure that out completely and we haven't figured out the full workflow for a computational journal i mean to give an example you know back in the day you would write a paper you type it on a typewriter you send it into a journal and there was this whole process of typesetting the paper and it was non-trivial you know copy editing typesetting etc all that went away. You know, it's all camera ready copy of you just send in the paper electronically and it's, it's, but now there's a different thing. If you're making a computational journal, the analog of copy editing is making sure the code actually works correctly and that the code goes on working correctly and building that sort of infrastructure to be able to do code copy editing code. And, and again, something that journals, traditional sort of paper journals haven't or paper like journals haven't had to deal with is you know, what if the 
uh, what if things change out from under you in terms of the computational infrastructure? How do you make sure that the, the thing that was written 20 years ago still works today? I mean, I'm proud of the fact that for Wolfram Language, we have a 35 year record of compatibility of, of code, but it's not trivial to achieve that. And for, for things where people have kind of, you know, skirted around the edges of what's, of, of what's specified, it's hard to make sure that's going to go on working. Right. But yeah, no, I think that that's some. Um, uh, is it... You know, if, you know back when back when back when uh, object orientation was an issue, they invited me to speak at as a keynote speaker at an object oriented conference, and for the first half of the of my talk, I kept using the word paradigm. <laughs> And the audience, you can see the audience is very uncomfortable because their keynote speaker was clearly an idiot and didn't know how to pronounce paradigm. So I gave half the talk using the word paradigm and how this object-oriented paradigm was something we should like. And then halfway through the talk, I switched and started demonstrating that I actually knew how to pronounce the word paradigm. And... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I then told the, 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 uh, that community that the world doesn't need a paradigm shift. You need a paradigm shift. Object orientation is going nowhere until you guys change your paradigm. I think some of that is in this area, the, C, the CDF, which I think is a monumental idea. But it has some parad paradigmal <laughs> problems. And the biggest one is the one you just touched on, which is, yeah, you have your code, but your code depends on a platform and it depends on libraries and it depends on databases and getting them into the CDF, I think, is the current is the current hard part. Well, I, we, we, we have a I mean, this is one of the things that makes the cloud interesting because you have your, you know, the cloud is this sort of reservoir of computational ability that one sort of assumes like the Internet is always on and always accessible. Once you make that assumption, these things like, oh, where did my database go, becomes a lot easier. I mean, in other words, I think that, you know, we've come to a time when you can reasonably assume that the engineering you do can take the internet for granted. You don't have to say, well, what happens if I'm not connected to the internet? It's, it's a reasonable assumption. There may be situations where you're not connected to the internet, but it's a reasonable assumption. I think the same, you know, with respect to things like, how do we deal with the fact that we've got all of this computation going on, but it relies on this database. But by the way, I mean, on the, on the subject of libraries, of course, in Wolfram Language, one of the things has been, everything's built into the language. There aren't, there isn't a chain of libraries that you have to go and, and, uh, and get. And I think that's, you know, that's been an important design principle. And yes, that is a thing. I mean, that's been the story of my life is, is spending every day trying to make sure that we actually have this coherent system that doesn't depend on sort of chains of libraries. And that, that indeed makes it, you know, so that gives us a huge step up. But of course, then we depend on things like, um, oh, what was the recent one? Um, uh, gosh, we were been working on um, uh, how country borders change because we obviously have data on country borders and country borders change and country borders change in ways that not everybody agrees how they changed. And how do you deal with that? And how do you keep, you know, when somebody has code that depends on these country borders and then the country borders change or, or the name of the country changes and is it still the same country or not? And so on. There's a big argument about this going on uh, right now um, in the Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and other places. You know, there are more country borders on the move than you might know unless you were maintaining a database of country borders. <laughs> which you are. <laughs> yes, which we happen to be. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, it's uh, the, 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 what one gets to learn more about how complicated the world is when one tries to make it all computable, so to speak. But, you know, I, I just want to say one more thing about sort of the open science thing and the ability of the public to engage and have opinions about science. You know, one of the things that I think is very interesting about kind of the, the science that we're doing is very foundational science. And in a sense, it is stripping away a lot of the technical detail and getting almost to sort of the philosophical level on many kinds of topics. And that's a level at which, because it, because it is stripping away a lot of the technical detail, 
to get down to these very foundational levels, it's it, it somehow that helps people's ability to engage with it. You know, if you have to understand a giant stack of, of you know, uh, abstract algebra and analytic number theory and all this kind of thing, to be able to even talk about something that's on the front lines of science, that's a big downer in terms of people's ability to engage. You know, the fact that we're really dealing with things which are, um, you know, there's a lot of technical detail in sort of how we get there, but in the end, we're talking about very fundamental, almost philosophical things. I think that helps the ability to, to have engagement. It also helps that, you know, simple programs, anybody can run them and anybody can kind of, we're all in the same boat. We're all computationally bounded observers of this computationally irreducible world. And those of us who've spent years, you know, learning more about sort of how things work, you, you've moved only a small distance relative to computational irreducibility. That is, you show me some simple cellular automaton rule, and I will not get much further than anybody else in telling you what consequences that rule will have. When I run it on a computer, sure, I can see what it does. But if you say, look at this rule, what's it going to do? Okay, I've been working on this stuff for 40 years. I might be able to pick out a few bits and pieces, but I will get almost nowhere compared to what you will actually see when that's worked out computationally. And that means that this is a, a this is an area where, you know, the the middle school kid who looks at this rule will be able to perhaps say some things about it too. They might get a little less far than I would get, depends on the middle school kid. Um, but you know, it's 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 sort of th this is again. We're really at this point where where it's kind of it's possible for people to contribute. It's possible for people to get involved in a way where it doesn't involve, you know, there are parts of what we're doing that really involve quite complicated sort of expert technical towers. But there are also other parts that are really very, very accessible. And the parts that are accessible can be important parts. You know, I, I, the one thing that it does slightly in a sense, if, if I have a concern, it's that we are building up really quite a big intellectual tower with about multi-computation, about the physics project and so on. There are entry points that are very, don't require going up that whole tower, but you know, increasingly to really make progress. And, and this is what typically happens. I mean, there'll be, you know, we're, we're in the period, I hope, of rapid progress. We will build a tower to get further after that tower has been built. You probably will have to understand the tower that, that we're constructing. Well, actually, I think that, I mean, personally, I take the view that if you really understand what you're doing, even if it is complicated and technical, it is usually possible to distill that explanation down to some kind of basic level that enthusiasts will be able to find accessible. But this is really, yeah. a, ma this is really a matter of choice of institutional culture. And so one thing that we will be doing at the Institute, you know, as part of the live streams, you see, I don't want the live streams to just be um, these kind of windows into you know, a normal kind of meeting Zoom. that we would hold between fellows. Yes, it has, it has to be the case that we, you know, we introduce the topic that we're discussing in a way that is accessible to the audience, that we actually set aside time to take questions from the community. And I was discussing this with Carlos just the other day. It's doing this, you, you don't just do it as a kind of a gesture to your supporters and your community in order to ensure that people can uh, people can possess some sort of, you know, fundamental understanding of what you're doing. It's also an important sanity check when you're doing the, the research yourself. I mean, especially when you're building up this complicated tower where you're considering particular applications or particular questions within your research program, you know, being able to, on almost a daily basis, be able to re-specify what are the key objectives how is it that what we're doing, you know, uh, complements or assists the pursuit of those objectives? What is the high level description? And then can we can we proceed to look at the at what we're doing at kind of different degrees of resolution? This is kind of a, a general, I don't know if you want to call it a quirk or what have you. This is something that I'm I'm pretty obsessed with. And the institute itself will be will be um, conducted in that way. I, I, I wanted yeah, to I mean, say I wanted to say something about about Bob's point about sharing these resources. So um, so we will also, there's, this was something that I, I didn't have a chance to discuss previously. We'll also have fellows who we're calling them, we're calling them DSI fellows. There is this kind of a, a movement towards um, kind of decentralized science or um, using Web3 and other kinds of technologies in order to redress some of these issues that we see in the sciences today, including publication, education, um, peer review, grant making, the replicability crisis, et cetera. So we will have 
uh, fellows who are who are working on developing these these kind of capabilities that we do want to see spread to others. So creating um, computational journals that really allow individuals not only to make use of our code, but to to ask questions and to be able to engage and really to ensure that the reader is able to understand what, what it is that we're doing. I mean, if you, if, you, if you have a question, if you're interested in some field of science that you normally don't dabble in, you know, often you'll find it's the case that when you try and actually get into the details that, um, that the, the actual field is, is relatively hostile to observers, or at least it's kind of implicitly <clears throat> made that way because there is so little um, information or resources that are made available that are kind of friendly or, um, or, or actually useful to the kind of general public. As soon as you start to think about how can you design a journal, how can you comport yourself as an institute, how can you engage with other people where you're really obsessed with trying to maximize the ability of people to understand what it is that you're doing, even if you're working on the Langlands program, even if you're working on real foundations, even if you're working on quantum field theory, even if you're working on uh, Black, Black Scholes uh, option pricing, it doesn't matter. It should always be a way for you to be able to describe what it is that you're doing. I mean, if comp computational equivalence teaches you anything, it's that, it's that the language program is really not that more not that much more complicated than say cooking. It's just that all the ingredients happen to have, you know, alien kind of exotic names. So, I mean, this is, this is something I'm absolutely adamant about both in the way that we conduct ourselves culturally, but also with our DSI fellows, um, with the, the capabilities that we develop, with the partnerships that we form. I think in the longer term, um, the Institute, we're of course going to be supported by, um, by donors and contributions in the short term. I think in the longer term, you know, nonprofits, Nonprofits also do make products, they do have services, and I think in the longer term, what we'll see is that we're going to make these tremendous advances, um, discover new findings, create new rich frameworks that address foundational questions that people really do care about, and we conduct ourselves in a way where we, we actively make sure that what we're doing is for the public benefit so that people can, can actually derive something useful from it, and then we create these additional resources infrastructure in order to continue to kind of expand that outward and then through you know partnerships and relationships with other people i think that increasingly it will be the kind of confluence of our scientific success and these investments that we make in public understanding that will inform kind of the products and the services that as a as a nonprofit we end up making in the future you know i, I want to just say one thing about explainability so to speak you know you talk about reproducibility there's also a bit of an explainability crisis in science and you know I myself, you know, I spent a decade working on new, a new kind of science, which I put, you know, a large part of that decade was spent trying to take what were fairly technical ideas and actually boil them down into things that I could explain to, to anybody, so to speak. That process turned out to be very valuable to me. It also opened up that area. But I think one thing that I'd love to see sort of, uh, uh, you know, culturally, in the science that we build and the examples that we provide for other kinds of science is you can, you know, people can ask questions about and discuss anything. It isn't the case that people just say, oh, well, there's an expert and the expert consensus was blah, blah, blah. That's all there is to say. You know, I really like the idea, maybe because uh, of, of, uh, of being able to open things up to the point where you can say, um, you know, where, where you can expect that anything could be disputed, so to speak, and where you can actually have a, an informed discussion with, with anybody who's prepared to, you know, in some cases it takes some intellectual effort to understand what's being said, and, and you, 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 you need that, that level of engagement. But it isn't the case that you have to just say, oh, no, that's just an expert thing. You know, you can't possibly understand that if you aren't part of the expert clique, so to speak. I think this idea that that it should be possible to have to discuss science with anybody, that's a kind of a cultural principle that, uh, well, I've tried to live myself for, for a long time, and which I hope will be something that is sort of a, 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 a core value, so to speak, of the Institute and the science we try and build going forward. And, uh, may I move adjournment? Yes. Yes, well, but we didn't give Philip the chance mm -hmm. to, to, I mean, so Bob's key point, which I think is, 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 a, is, a, is a prescient point, is, you know, when we say, you know, we're, we're doing this for science, we're doing that for science, it shouldn't be that we're trying to kind of bear the burden of defending science with a capital S. It's much more the, other, the opposite case that what we're doing is, is somewhat of a, 
of a very well-meaning user patient and really trying to set new standards, both in the ways that we build our framework uh, and in terms of the methods that we provide in terms of the actual tools that we make and how we present those to other people. So by setting the higher standards, by doing better science, we're not defending science, but that's really a scientific effort. And that's, I mean, in some sense, that's even the, the market effort as well, which is to you know, create a better future just by setting new standards and by, by doing things better. But Philip, we've, you know, I, I kind of asked, asked both yes. Bob you this question and then we haven't actually turned to you. So please, um, what- I what, mean, my, what like my last thing, I, I would just say, I, you know, part of what I like about the approach that we're talking about, like Stephen was talking about live streaming uh, himself working. I think that projects that have a lot of unknown unknowns, and I think Second Life was certainly one of these where, it, it was just a mess of stuff. Nobody thought it would work. And all the different pieces of it were pretty different in terms of where the problems came from, networking, compression, uh, uh, rendering, uh, simulation. I, I think that the, 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 aside from the, you know, the work that I look forward to doing here, I think the thing that makes sense about the, the, the general strategy of the Institute um, is that if you have problems where you really are digging into something that nobody knows how to do, you want to be multidisciplinary you want to be iterative and experimental and you want to be open uh, yeah that's that's going to create a greater likelihood that you get the thing to, to work or you get it figured out and I, I think broadly right society you know we're moving we are opening up new areas of science for example where there's a lot of uncertainty and so that kind of an approach i think this kind of an approach of the institute then then will bear fruit often you know as opposed to something like trying to make a you know, a lighter car tire or something where you know what the problem is, you know what you need to do, you know, we're, we're pursuing a lot of problems that are not like that. So I, I love what's going on here. But thanks. I agree. We got to get all run. <laughs> so Greg, Greg used children to get off this conference. <laughs> I was, I, I have, my dogs <laughs> want my dog. I'm just dogs. impressed that the Zoom is picking up your dog's face now as a, as a, as a <laughs> right, right. focus on. Well, my point. two dogs are dying to have dinner, so I got to go feed all them. Right. <laughs> That's, uh, well, thank you all for joining us, and um, uh, we're excited. We're, we're launched. Thank you for helping us uh, launch. We don't have the – I don't know how you launch an institute. It's like a, a ship you, you have the – do people still do that of breaking yes, champagne? They do. On ships? The and you're allowed to do it also. <laughs> <laughs> Except I don't have any champagne. But yeah, um, we'll, we'll, we'll consider it virtually done. The, I'll bring the champagne next time. Sounds good. Well, right. thanks, well, thank, Bob. Thank you very much. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. And once again, thanks to Wolfram Research for, for kind of hosting this. In some ways, it's symbolic that we are kind of launching or we're, we're spinning off and the kind of launch pad really has been, really has been the company. Uh, we will be obviously live streaming and recording meetings um, now that we're launched you know, throughout the week, um, but that will be on our own social media channels and um, we will continue to keep you updated um, about that. Anyway, thanks everyone. Um, Congratulations. For part of the launch. Yes, thank, thank you so much. Take care. Uh, thank you, everyone. Cheers.